Smith, myself, Bernard Parks is the chair. What we're going to do on the agenda is go with item three, uh, and then item two, the controller is going to be here on that item, and then we'll do item one, which is our financial status report, which will take considerably more time than anything else. We do not have any closed session items. So to start off with the item three, we have a number of cards, and we will ask you to come up to fill up the, the front table here with four at a time. And as you finish your comments, if you could allow that seat to be uh, vacated so others can come up. The first four speakers uh, will be uh, Catherine Casey, Jim McQuiston, Mary, uh, I'm sorry, Mark Allen, Damian Jones are the first four. But Laura, John is still the same now. And for the committee and actually for the public, uh, item three is a joint report uh, by the CAO and the CLA on the potential uh, billboard off-site sign tax uh, to be placed on the March 2011 budget. Okay. Let me ask uh, Ryan Brooks. All right. Give your name, please. Good morning, Councilman. Damian Jones. I'm representing, representing the Los Angeles Outdoor Advertising Coalition. Uh, Los Angeles Outdoor Advertising Coalition is comprised <clears throat> of the largest outdoor advertising companies in Los Angeles. Together, we represent more than 90% of all the legal billboards and outdoor advertising opportunities in Los Angeles. We've been firmly committed to finding a long-term workable billboard ordinance for more than two years. We continue to believe that we can work with city departments, the city council, and the mayor's office to create an ordinance that addresses the appropriate time, place, and manner for billboards in Los Angeles, as well as creating a revenue-generating opportunities for the city. We are here today to express our strong opposition to this proposed tax on Los Angeles businesses. Los Angeles has one of the highest unemployment rates in California that is more than two percentage points above the state's unemployment number. At 14 percent, this number is a huge hurdle for the city to overcome as we struggle to right the economy. Now is not the time for the city to enact an onerous new ta business tax as we collectively grapple with the worst economic slump in our lifetime. Nearly 40,000 jobs have been lost in Los Angeles County last year alone. This new business tax will reduce local employment and personal income substantially. By artificially increasing the cost of advertising, there will be less advertising and therefore less revenues for companies who rely upon this advertising to drive business. This in turn is a downward spiral that will lead to fewer jobs and hiring in Los Angeles. You cannot balance the budget, you cannot balance the city budget on the backs of local businesses. Los Angeles businesses already deal with the highest business and sales tax and most demanding regulatory environment in California, if not the United States. There are ways to achieve your desired goals of raising revenue without taxing the outdoor advertising industry. I ask and encourage you to work with the members of our coalition to review alternatives to this tax proposal. We look forward to continuing our discussion to find a mutually, benefit, mutually beneficial solution to this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Kristen Monte Lahner, and I'm here representing the Motion Picture Association, which includes Disney, Paramount, Sony, 20th Century Fox, Universal, and Warner Brothers. The MPAA would like to echo the concerns and opposition expressed by the coalition against this tax proposal. Billboard, billboards are an essential tool for any film marketing campaign. We urge you to carefully consider this action and its impact on the entertainment community and the larger business community in Los Angeles during these tough economic times. Thank you. We have those two seats of Mr. Uh, next person, Mr. Ray, Ryan Brooks and Beverly Kenworthy. I would start over here. Okay. Council members, I'm Catherine Casey, representing um, Jefferson at Hollywood today the developer and owner of the Jefferson at Hollywood Mixed Use Project located at 1724 North Highland Avenue in Hollywood. Today, the Committee on Budget and Finance will consider a proposal to levy a 12% excise tax on revenue from billboards and super graphics in the City of Los Angeles. This proposal arises from the City's consideration of several alternative revenue sources to be used to balance the ailing City budget. I urge the committee to consider the unintended consequences of assembling such a steep tax on developers and owners who are working collaboratively with the city to invest revenue from billboards and super graphics into project that, projects that serve other city goals and objectives, including improving the quality and affordability of housing stock and creating transit-oriented neighborhoods. 
The projected revenue stream from billboards and super graphics is often a critical element in a developer's assessment of the economic viability of such projects. In developing the Jefferson at Hollywood project, um, Jefferson and Van Wagner, the super graphic signage lessee, expended considerable sums to remove old and blighted signage from the project site and another location in Hollywood. The new development integrates two super graphic signs into the design of a 270 unit mixed use project. And of those 270 units, 10% were set aside for affordable housing. These affordable housing units are located in the heart of Hollywood. But for the revenue that Jefferson obtains from those super graphics on site, this transit oriented affordable housing benefit to the community would not have been economically viable. In short, the proposed excise tax may produce a short term increase in revenue for the city. However, it will have the unintended consequence of creating economic barriers to future redevelopment and impacting other potential long term opportunities for private developers. Thank you. Mr. Allen. Good morning. My name is Mort Allen. Uh, I just uh, kind of uh, don't quite understand what's what's going on here. You can't tax illegal billboards. And at this point, everything is such a mess. And we're in government. We're trying to clean up messes. Everybody knows there's messes. OK, there has been. Now, our whole problem starts with this motion that was uh, September 13th, 2006, which was this motion to uh, settle the billboard agreement, which uh, Mr. Parks presented and Mr. Smith seconded. Everybody seems to want to blame uh, Jack Weiss, but this started it. It was wrong. We have a different city attorney now. We have different counsel. And what we have to look at is the first thing first, OK? Now, during our campaign for two years, billboards were the number one issue. And it wasn't so much that people don't like them. They don't like the fact that, like, these digitals are supposedly, according to websites, bringing in $97,000 a month and the city gets nothing. Right. Now, we have looked at other cities. Now, we have 15 council districts. If you put six digitals in each district on city-owned properties, like, say, Piper Summer downtown here, okay? And if they only brought in the same 97000 and at the airport, we have a uh, CB, or DECO pays the city 70% of the revenue. And it's like digitals where they're programmed outside. All right? Now, if we do an RFP on 90 billboards in the city, six in each district, and they give us 70% of the 97000 you're talking about right there $70 million a year. Okay? So the first thing is let's go forward. Let's get these on the city properties because Newt and I did it the other night. He said digital's of the future. It's like everybody's got a flat screen TV. So I think that the tax is great to say, and they're going to fight the tax just for rhetoric to whatever. But let's look at the big picture. And the first thing is we need to get the three investigators to find out what's illegal. And I think that you should go back to the motion a few months ago for $300,000 to get three investigators to, to go out and get the illegal billboards. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, also, the next two speakers, Lisa Gritzner and Ann Wynn. All right. Mr. Chairman, members of the council, thank you very much. My name is Ryan Brooks, and I represent the California State Association of America. And the last speaker actually you know, hits at some of my key points. We believe this tax, one, other than being illegal and it violates the First Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, it's been tried in states like Florida and Texas, and it's all been done, uh, said to be unconstitutional. The Philadelphia model that the CLA is proposing was done as part of a settlement agreement, so the way it's written right now hasn't gone through the court system, and we strongly believe that once it gets to the, you know, the higher courts, they'll deem this as unconstitutional. But the reason I'm here right now is to say there's other models I think the city should look at. For example, right here in Los Angeles, the MTA has billboards on city-owned property. The MTA collects about $2 million worth of revenue just on those boards that are on city-owned property. Uh, a month ago, the city of Oakland uh, created a, a request for proposal, an RFP. In that request for proposal, they said if you remove a, a mount number of billboards and put them on city-owned property, the city will join in that revenue. Currently, uh, your own city, you guys enjoy advertising revenue with CBS and JC Deco on our street furniture project. And by the way, if this tax actually goes through, they'll be taxing yourselves. 
because the street furniture project would get the tax, the advertising on buses would get the tax, overall uh, deficit of revenue to the city. Uh, also in the city of Oakland, this, uh, we have a CBS Outdoor has a partnership with the Port of Oakland, which funds Jerry Brown's Academy, brings over a million dollars worth of revenue to it without a new tax. This budget committee should look at ways of partnering with the advertising industry and try to uh, punitively tax the advertising industry. You sell on yourself short if you think that a 12% tax is going to solve the problems. There's easier ways of doing it. And also, if you look at the C uh, CLA report, it's two, they, they estimate about $227 million over two years, and they're saying $24 million in revenue. That's actually $11 million a year. I outlined probably about $50 million of revenue you guys are leaving on the table. There's a better and more efficient way to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, could we have Maya come up and replace and we can Kenworthy? Good afternoon. Beverly Kenworthy with the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce opposes um, this effort to um, tax billboard companies. We believe that this is just sort of an easy target and could end up hurting um, far more than just these firms. Um, higher costs could be incurred by the small businesses seeking to advertise their services, as well as advertising communication firms and printing companies. The question of unintended consequences, I think, is a really big one. And it's one of the reasons why the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce advocated so strongly in this past year on the creation of the Office of Economic Analysis. It is for just this type of motion that um, we believe needs to be studied for its economic impact. Um, you never know what the consequences are going to be. And in order for the city to make uh, sound policy, um, these types of things need to be studied. We understand that you know there is some concern about this March deadline. But that should not trump good policy. And uh, the city has been operating far too long without understanding um, the real consequences of some of um, these motions. And so we really encourage the city to take a step back and look at what what this motion would actually bring into the city. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dennis Hathaway, come up on the Hi, Lisa Gritzner from Sorrell Associates representing Van Wagner Outdoor. Um, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to speak with you about this. Um, we recognize the challenges that the city faces with regard to revenue. Um, and these are unprecedented times for both the business industry in, and industry as well as government. Um, I'd like to echo what Beverly has said and what you've heard from a lot of folks here today. Over the past week, we've been reaching out to folks from a wide uh, variety of of backgrounds to talk to them about what the impacts of a, of a billboard tax like this could bring to the community. And I think from Van Wagner's perspective, we've been working with or trying to work with the city for close to two years now to try to fix the challenges with the existing billboard ordinance, which you guys well know, as well as to try to find and identify revenue alternatives um, and alternatives for permitting and licensing um, and fees that we could bring to the table. So we'd really like to ask the council to to consider asking the CLA or the Office of Economic Policy to sit down with the industry and to work together collaboratively to find solutions to the revenue challenges and the permitting challenges, frankly, that are faced by our industry. Thank you. Mr. Delbeck, you next. Ann. Good afternoon. Ann Nguyen with the Central City Association. On behalf of CCA's 350 members, I want to express our concern with the proposal to place a tax on billboards on the March 2011 ballot. We do understand that it's a difficult time uh, for municipalities throughout California, and LA is not alone in its struggle to do more with less. However, we cannot stand behind the ballot initiative um, because it misses the bigger picture. Our sign ordinance is broken and unworkable. Business needs an environment where the rules are known and we can move forward with certainty. Right now, the rules are in such a state of flux that everyday business decisions cannot be made. Imposing this tax without undergoing a comprehensive rework of the sign ordinance is short-sighted. It places a Band-Aid on the problem without addressing the real, is the real issues at hand. I'm sure planning staff will agree with me uh, when I say that this issue has been a huge drain on their resources. This is the wrong road to be going down, and we believe the city should focus its limited re resources on fixing the ordinance instead of imposing this tax. Thank you. Heidi Mathers, next come up. Good afternoon. Maya Zettler on behalf of VICA. On behalf of VICA's 340 members, I'm here today to express our strong concern for this proposal before you today. 
We believe that this plan is short-sighted and will be just another onerous business tax. It is wrong to believe that sign companies will eat the 12%. They, in fact, will pass this on to their consumers, which in this case are businesses. Businesses will have to make decisions on whether to cut their advertising budgets or cut their staff, and we are concerned that they will elect to cut their staff. We believe that this proposal, as you've heard today, should first be evaluated by the Office of Economic Analysis so that we together can put, study this proposal and come up with sound public policy. In addition, we believe that the outdoor advertising issues continue to be at the Council's agenda constantly and consistently over the past few years. This scattered approach can create legal challenges for the city and does not deal with the issue holistically. We need to put resources into completing the final sign ordinance instead of using a piecemeal approach. The public deserves a comprehensive and consensus on this ordinance, and we hope that you will oppose the proposal before you today. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Dennis Hathaway, president of the Coalition to Ban Billboard Blight, which represents individuals and community groups throughout Los Angeles. We support the concept of a tax on billboards. The signs themselves are on private property, but in essence they occupy public space because they're broadcasting their messages in a, in a wide kind of view. And uh, those public spaces are paid for and maintained by the public. So. Uh, this occupation of those spaces by the billboard companies, it's only fair that they pay something to uh, help maintain those spaces. There are a couple of concerns we have. One is that the stated goal of the city, including some, uh, I think a, a couple of councilmen probably right here, is to reduce the number of billboards in their districts. Um, if, uh, and this is a goal, I think, that's widely popular with the public. Um, we don't want to see a billboard tax that might act as an incentive to actually uh, not reduce billboards or actually increase the number of billboards. Another issue uh, has to do with the digital billboards. Um, the digital, there are 101 digital billboards right now. Um, if you look at Clear Channel's own published rates, one single billboard can generate as much as $800,000 a year in revenue. Um, and uh, at 12 percent, that's $96,000 for 101 billboards. That's over $9 million. So that's a significant amount of money. And yet those billboards are in legal limbo um, because of the court decision. And a lot of people uh, in places where these billboards are who are affected by light trespass, who are concerned about traffic safety, pedestrian safety, want them out of their neighborhoods. And we would hope that with this measure that um, steps are considered to to um, take note of those community concerns and not have any in unintended consequences. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask again, is uh, Ms. Uh, Heidi Mathers here? Not will put your comments uh, for the record. Also, uh, last speaker is Patrice Williams to come up. Honorable Council Members, Bill Delvac of Arm Brewster, Goldsmith and Delvac. I'm here today on behalf of Legacy and Gatehouse, the developers and owners of the Hollywood and Vine project. As I'm sure you know, this is a very important redevelopment project. In fact, the type of public-private partnership that the city has worked for years to sponsor. In that project, signage from the very beginning has been integral into the architecture, into creating character, but frankly, from the city's perspective, most importantly, integral to the financing. The public was involved in bringing this project to reality, and the sign revenue is part of the, the financing for the project. In fact, bonds were issued based on revenue flows. Uh, this, puts, this tax could put the bonds at risk. And bonds aren't just pieces of paper. There are bondholders. In this case, CalPERS itself, an investor in the project, might end up, in fact, being harmed by it. The city has many competing goals, to be sure. You've heard about some of the competing goals just about this. But do not, as part of this, put at risk the hard work you've done for uh, decades now in creating public-private partnerships. We urge you to consider in the measure an exemption narrowly targeted and focused for signage that's been allowed in public-private partnerships under agreements such as development agreements, disposition and development agreements, sign agreements, or supplemental use sign districts. The developers of these projects relied on that as financing. The city urged these projects to use that financing. Don't harm them now. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, council members. I'm looking at this Your as name, please. yes. My name is Patrice Williams. I'm with the Minorities in Broadcasting Training Program, and we also host the Going Green Film Festival. It's a nonprofit organization that's been around since 1992, and I'm looking at this as uh, in a different light than some people. Uh, we really depend on those billboards to help get our message out and to support our charities. As you've heard uh, during this economy, we've lost a lot of charities have closed their doors. In fact, some of our partner charities have closed their doors, and we're struggling to make sure that doesn't happen to us. And it's very important to us because we actually find work for people in broadcast journalism. So if our doors are closed, less people will go to work. Um, the Clear Channel and some of the other companies, CBS, they actually have PSAs where they allow charities to post their messages on their billboards, and that has been invaluable to us. Without that, people wouldn't know about us, less funding would come in, and we would fall to the wayside like so many other charities have had. And that, that it's just so important that that is still something that we can look to as something that the community can donate to us. Now, if the 12% ta tax uh, goes through, there will be less uh, pro bono space for the charities to get their messages out there. And it's not just um, our organization or advertising a film festival. If you go look at those billboards at night, you'll see missing persons um, that they're trying to find. You'll see amber alerts. Um, there's so many important messages or where you can get a free AIDS test, that sort of thing. So that's something that will dwindle if this tax goes through and there will be less space and less pro bono space for us. So I hope you consider that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can we have the city staff come up uh, on this issue and also Office of Finance, CLACAO? Do we have anyone from the mayor's office uh, also? Is there anyone here from the mayor's business team? Gary, why don't you come on up? CLA, CAO. Hi, Charles Modica with the CLA, and I'm joined by Rex Olive with the CAO. Do we have anybody here from our Office of Finance? Could we find, uh, see if we can find somebody from Office of Finance and also the mayor's office and see if they're interested in this issue? Okay, why don't you start? Uh, as I said, Charles Modica with the CLA's office. Uh, during the adoption of the city's most recent budget, the city council instructed the CLA and the CAO to begin the process for placing a billboard tax on the March 2011 ballot. Uh, in response to that motion, our office has met several times, uh, also with the city attorney and the Office of Finance, to develop a specific proposal. With advice from those offices, we developed the proposal, which is before you right now, which calls for a 12% excise tax to be placed on revenue generated by off-site signed sales. Uh, based on analysis of business tax receipts provided by the Office of Finance, uh, it looks like billboard and super graphic advertising companies in Los Angeles generated an average annual revenue of $227 million over the last two years. Uh, now, with our proposed 12% tax on, or excise tax on that revenue, we would expect this uh, tax to generate approximately $24 million in tax revenue annually beginning of the year after the uh, bill would be enacted should the council choose to go forth and place that tax on the ballot and that tax was adopted. Uh, we are available for questions and any more details that you need. Let me ask you, uh, in the sense of the tax, uh, they paid something like $220 million in gross receipt tax? Uh, yes, I think okay. currently they are subject to a half percent business tax on that, so this would be an additional 12 percent. Okay, now who pays the t this additional $24 million? Is that the billboard company or is it the people buying the ads? Uh, we propose that the model we go forward with is based on the model in the city of Philadelphia, and that model subjects the tax to those who are paying for the ads. It will be collected by the billboard company and then remitted to the city. Okay, so the billboard company would be collecting. Right. Okay. Did, did we have any involvement with the billboard companies in your task force? No. No, no sir, we did not. Okay, is there a reason? Your name for the record, please. Uh, my name is Rex Olla. I'm with the CAO. 
essentially what we did is develop a tax proposal based on the council motion when the budget was adopted. What this is, is our best thinking on the mechanics of putting together a tax that could appear on the ballot if that were the choice of the mayor and council. So also, was there any involvement of the mayor's office and the business team, Mr. Buechner's personnel? I did not consult with them. The one thing, have we done any analysis to see as many people have spoken today as to what the positive or negative impact could be on business or people's use of this medium? Well, presumably it would result in somewhat increased costs, although I should say that the proposal before you would establish a tax on revenue generated from billboard sales. Now, the actual price of those billboard sales or any amount of dollars to be collected per square foot of advertising, we don't get into. The actual tax would be on the revenue generated, and the revenue generated is based on the prices that the billboard companies establish. Can you tell us what the 12 percent was based on? Certainly. We propose a 12 percent excise tax because we believe that that is consistent with other city users' tax. The city's transient occupancy tax is 14 percent. The commercial industrial users' tax is 12.5 percent. The city's parking users' tax is 10 percent. So we pick 12 percent of the number that seems to be consistent with those. So you made it consistent with our excise, our previously approved excise tax? Yes. And then did you have a comment about whether any consideration was given to businesses that already have entitlements that deal with use districts or entitlements? Did we consider at all any carve-out, being that they already have been given the ability to have those signs at the pricing that's there? The thought was this is a uniform tax to be uniformly applied. It is possible. We have exceptions to our utility users' tax, for example. So there are things that could be carved out, but this does not propose that. And did you talk at all to the city attorney to see how this would impact the current litigation on billboards? We did speak extensively with the city attorney, and we did not receive any specific advice that this would be detrimental to ongoing litigation. The city attorney would be better to answer that. Do we have a city attorney here representing? This is obviously not a hot issue. Good afternoon. Ken Fong from the city attorney's office. I understand the question was would the proposed billboard? We have a bunch of litigation. We have things going through different courts. We've put a freeze on different types of boards. How does this, and then we have this, as someone mentioned earlier, this age-old issue of knowing how many and where are legal versus illegal boards. Has that been part of your advice to the task force in developing this proposal? Well, we have addressed that somewhat, but we don't feel that the proposed tax ordinance would affect existing litigation. However, there's always the possibility that one or more billboard companies would challenge this in court. No. Yes. No. But, again, you don't think it affects the pending litigation in court? No, I don't think so. And then what about the issue of, as someone mentioned earlier, the boards that we've not surveyed boards to determine what's an illegal board or a legal board, things of that nature? Well, we haven't had much discussion with staff on that, but I would assume that they would approach that the same way they approach other businesses, that whoever is subject to the tax ought to pay it. Let me ask Office of Finance, does currently we collect business tax from billboard companies? That is correct. Now, currently do the people who buy the ads from the billboard companies, do they pay any kind of sales tax or anything as part of their costing? 
um, uh, forgive me, Ed Cabrera, Office of Finance. Th there are some aspects of the uh, advertising uh, industry that would uh, have activity that is subject to sales tax. And in our discussions with the city attorney, uh, the proposed uh, 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 excise tax on billboard activity uh, would not impact the city's ability to assert the sales tax, uh, which is administered by the uh, state of California, nor would it have any impact on the city's ability to assert the business tax, which is under the Office of Finance. But do, do we collect sales tax? That's what I want to find out. Uh, yes, for some of the activity, correct. Some of the activity which is related to uh, uh, the production of a tangible product, uh, whether it is advertised material, um, is currently subject to sales tax. Do we know how much of, of the $220 million worth of uh, business taxes are also uh, impacted by sales tax? Uh, no, we don't. We don't have that uh, data at this time. Basically, the production... Uh, does it also include the space or the actual uh, renting of the boards, or, the, or do you have it, any idea what 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 part it, of it is has sales tax attached? The, the actual production uh, of a tangible product, such as the advertising uh, um, uh, material, uh, the establishment of that. Uh, particular uh, advertisement, if it's a tangible good, um, could be subject to sales tax. If, it, if, the, if the advertising uh, end product, whether it's a tangible good such as the actual material itself, that could be subject to sales tax. Uh, just a couple of questions. First of all, do you know what category the billboard companies are in and our business tax? Uh, they fall under uh, several different categories. Um, they could fall under the professions and occupation category. Which is the uh, highest. The, that is the highest. They also, some of their activity falls under our advertising agency classification. And then a third category is the actual commercial uh, rental uh, category for, let's say, just rental of the billboard structure itself. Okay, so if, would it be more logical to adjust that category designation than it would be put this additional tax on them? Uh, well, I, I guess the analysis that uh, our staff had provided to the work group uh, was more focused on several different options, um, uh, one of which was the excise tax. And, it, and uh, my understanding is that the analysis uh, determined that that was the most feasible uh, approach um, to take in terms of applying a, a, a new tax. Um, I'm not certain what the analysis uh, 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 was undertaken in terms of if the, if the business tax could provide a viable alternative to the excise tax. Um, I had staff members that had been working with the CAO and CLA on that. Um, so I know that they did look at various alternatives, and the excise tax was the alternative that uh, the working group felt was more feasible uh, and beneficial for the city. From a dollar point of view? or Yes, correct. So you, you think you just get more bang for the buck by doing this? additional tax then adjusting the tax cut. That's correct. <clears throat> or, or bringing back the 15 percent tax cut we gave generally to business over the last few years. That, that would be correct. So that's a bigger dollar amount. Right. Um, secondly, uh, and from the industry point of view really is what is the average value of a <clears throat> the monthly value of a traditional standard board a 24 sheet 32 sheet billboard versus the super graphics. What do they get on the revenue on, on an average board? They would have to tell you. I don't yeah, know. Some of them. Well, they won't tell you that. So, well, it's, it's been my observation as a as a businessman in my past history um, that the standard billboards are the ones that local businesses will use. No one. There's no chance that a guy like me who had a small business could ever afford a super graphic. And the national advertisers are going to use the big billboards. So when people come up and say they're going to, people aren't going to use billboards as much. You're going to lose jobs and all that. I don't think that's the case on the supers because those are the national advertising accounts. They don't pay attention to these nickels and dime issues. You'll see that on the small billboards, where the local business, the regional bank, and those kind of people use those small billboards. And that's where you might have the impact. And I don't think we've analyzed that. I'd like to see that analysis. I haven't seen it. Um, and it just, and I know a lot of people say we're going to lose some jobs by doing this. I, I think we've gained a lot of jobs because every lobbyist in town is in the room today. So I don't see where we're going to lose a lot of jobs. But <laughs> um, obviously the potential is that I, I think really, 
in my studies when I ever when I was at UCLA, I did go to UCLA by the way. Um, so this, this is an admission of guilt. He went to a class. Yeah, it's an admission of guilt. <laughs> um, now, I actually study, I have a degree in advertising from UCLA. Um, one of the things we always look at is in basic econ economies, uh, problems like we're having today, uh, where people are restricting their corporate uh, budgets, the, one of the first things cut is always advertising. And, and so, wise or not, that is the first thing that's easiest to cut because it doesn't cost your local, your, your company jobs. Um, so I think in an economy like we have today to uh, start a tax uh, on a business uh, like them or not, whether you like billboards or not, a, a tax on a business that supports local businesses, that's the small billboard side of the industry, is uh, not productive. I think it's harmful. Um, uh, small businesses are trying to hang on. The worst thing they can do is cut their advertising budgets, but most of them do. And that's not something I think we should encourage. But what we haven't done is look at an economic analysis of this from those kind of points of view. What is the trades we're going to get? What is the value we're going to get? Is this the best way to go? And so when some folks said that's what we established that uh, Office of Economic Analysis for, I think they're absolutely right. That's what the whole job of that organization should be or that function should be, and I don't know how far we are along in establishing that, but this might be the first case study where we really need to look at the, the trade-offs. Uh, what do you gain by doing this? Are there better models? Um, is it wise to tax that small billboard when that's the local company's billboards versus the super graphics when I really don't care whether we're taxing the Coca-Colas and Fords or not, or, or government motors? Those are the folks that can pay it and will pay it. So I think, anyway, uh, Mr. You know, Rosenau, this was your motion. I think maybe the discussion is need to be had. The <coughs> problem is um, this kind of came out of nowhere for me. I know we talked about it in the budget, and then all of a sudden here's a proposal on our desk. We haven't really vetted this out, and I think it needs to be vetted. So maybe this is a good first discussion, but I don't think this should be the last discussion. I agree with um, um, my colleague on this shouldn't be the last discussion, but let me ask you a few questions. Uh, how many billboards do we have in the city? I don't know. Why don't we know? Who's the building safety? Anybody, Somebody from building and safety here? How much time do you got? <laughs> do you have any idea? Wait, are you building and, building and safety? Do you know how many we got? <laughs> Can anybody leave though? I got a lot of questions. Uh, Frank Bush, I'm the Assistant Chief of the Code Enforcement Hi, Bureau. Um, during our off-site sign uh, survey that we've done citywide, we've identified approximately 6,200 uh, sign structures and approximately a little over 9,000 sign faces. What does that mean? Uh, some of the uh, structures have uh, two, face, two signs on them. So uh, there, there are 6,200 structures. Roughly, yes. And that basically includes digital? Yes. Uh, do you agree with what somebody said there's 101 digitals? I believe that that is the number. Somewhere, it's right around 100, 90 to 100, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. Do we get any revenue stream at all from the digital? Uh, permits, as far as building permits, and safety is concerned, yeah. yeah, permit inspections, yeah. yes. And, and the same question to the overall 6,200. Besides the permit charge, do we get any revenue stream at all? Uh, not that I know of. I, I'm not aware of it, okay. put it that way, other than the permits. Yeah. Great. Appreciate that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. When you did Philadelphia, what did you find out besides 12, maybe 12 percent? When you say we want to model ourselves after Philly, explain that a little bit. The Philadelphia tax, I believe, was 7%, just to start with. And I think they have a revenue from that, and I don't recall the numbers, two or three million dollars a year. Do you recall, Charles? Uh, I believe it was around three million dollars per year from that. Three million they took in from that. Uh, okay. The model was also somewhat appealing to us because it was a uh, just flat percentage on revenue. It didn't go into any of the details on taxing square footage of advertising. It didn't classify different types of advertising. It was just a flat percentage of revenue brought in for off-site sign revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, the digital boards, um, is it just uh, uh, Clear Channel that has them? Anybody know that answer? CBS has 13 in the city. Why don't you come up? And where's Clear Channel? Are you here too? Clear Channel. Not a lobbyist, but the, somebody from the company. Okay. 
Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. How many did you say your name again for the record? Ryan Brooks with CBS Outdoor. And to answer your question, we have 13 digital signs in the city. Mm -hmm. uh, and your name again, sir? Lane Lawson with uh, Clear Channel. And how many do you have? 86. So 86 in that, I can do my math, is that 101? Ninety-nine. So somebody said 101. So it's between 99. That's 99. Okay. Um, somebody also said that roughly $800,000 comes in per sign. Is that true? I don't have those figures. Do you have any figures about what you generate off no, of your digital? No, I don't. You don't. No. Okay. Do you? No, but what I what I do know, council member, is if you want to model this after most cities, like the city of Oakland. And it's, it's public record. You can take a look at the record and the revenues. Their model is probably the best model that a city has. The digital sign is on city-owned property. Jerry Brown with the Oakland School for the Arts said, why don't we create a model? If you guys take down an X number of signs, put it on city-owned property, and they help fund the Oakland School for the Arts, incredible model. We do this, Los Angeles has the MTA. A group of signs are on MTA property a little under $1.8 million revenue to the city. The city owns has about 4,500 pieces of property. If the goal is to reduce the total number of signs and put them in appropriate places and create a revenue stream, this $11 million a year, what you're talking about, is nothing. Okay, I appreciate that. J just so you know, we're looking for revenue generation. I don't want to lay off any, any more uh, librarians or or, or uh, parks or, or cops uh, or, or city workers of any kind. Yeah. I'm looking for revenue streams to keep going forward. I don't want to impact you, business you, in a negative way or anything else. Thank you. For you that. already have it with uh, our JCPO. You don't have any numbers on you, or can you get us those numbers? I don't have any figures on me, no. Okay. Uh, are we able to subpoena that information, or how do we get that kind of information? Obviously, I want to know what you make. Is it eight hundred? Right. Well, I mean, you have you have our you have our revenue figures off the gross receipts, uh, our um, our business license tax. Is that well, true? We make uh, building and safety, besides the placement location, finance. Finance. Yeah. Um, we we obviously do have reported tax measures and tax liabilities um, as to whether that covers uh, an entity's entire. Uh, transactions that that would be subject to audit, but the information is self-reported. So um, I don't know that the information that we have and that we've already provided to CLA and CAO in an aggregate format um, does capture all of the activity of of the uh, entities that you're addressing today. So you don't know. Well, we have information that has been uh, uh, provided to us by uh, building the safety in terms of locations. So we we do have information as far as who's registered and who's not, sure. who's paying, and so forth. But uh, again, if you're the information we have versus the information that the entities here um, uh, refer to, um, we have no idea unless we've actually conducted an audit whether that information is and we haven't conducted or not. an audit for these 99 digital, so we don't know. That's correct. Okay. All right. Uh, it's just feeding into what Mr. Smith is saying. We have to do more homework on this. So we need to know what kind of revenue stream you're projecting. If we're hearing $800,000 and all you're paying is a placement thing, that's a revenue stream potential for this great city that needs revenue. Uh, and so um, we need to know the numbers we're really looking at and the facts that we're really de dealing with. Is there somebody from the mayor's office here? Where's the mayor's leadership on this? Is he for a tax or not? I think they're going to send somebody down. Do we have somebody from the mayor's office who can comment on this issue? Here we go. Somebody's enthusiastically coming up to the mic. <laughs> <laughs> With great vigor, I might add. Got pulled out of something, huh? How are you? Terrific. Your name? Mark Mullen. And your job? Um, Chief Operating Officer of the Office of Business and Economic Policy. Very good. Senior advisor. Well, what do you think about this idea of a ballot measure uh, for a revenue stream for digital and other forms of 6,200 uh, billboards out there? What's the mayor's position on that? Well, he doesn't have a position only because we just learned about this yesterday, to be honest. So we're happy, you know, for any position, sure. for any issue we are that is brought up that has an economic impact, either positively or negatively, we try to take an analysis of it. Sure. We haven't done that. Um, you know, if it shows that it's it's going to be a good revenue producer and it's uh, and the sign companies believe it's helpful for them in terms of policing, 
the existing infrastructure, then we'll determine that in some sort of analysis. If it shows that it's not something that's positive for job growth or other things like that, we'll, we'll show that as well. But I think it's something that's important enough, especially considering the, the issue in city attorney's office on this, to um, look at it a little bit longer than a day. I agree with you on that. Um, uh, is there somebody from the ballot group here, uh, our clerk's office? Clerk office person about putting this on the ballot? Is this going, is this going on the Wednesday agenda? Well, obviously, look, obviously it's half-baked. It isn't together. Uh, and we need to do a lot more homework on this issue. Uh, please. I think, it's, I think it's going on the Wednesday of the 20th or 27th. I see. It's going to go before the Rules Committee on the 20th or 27th? I believe they're looking at the 27th. Pardon me? I believe the Rules Committee is considering hearing this on the 27th, on the 27th. depending what your committee okay. does. Miranda passed our office of the city clerk. What was the question? Can the question is, when is the last time we can get our act together to put it on the March ballot? Well, the council, I can take that. The council would have to uh, request the city attorney to prepare an ordinance and ta title, ballot title by November 3rd. So it's November 3rd again. Okay. All right. Um, uh, Mr. Parks, I, I, you know, this is the first we're having our interaction here. There's a lot of questions. First, we need to know how many billboards and if it's 6,200. Uh, two, we need to know what kind of revenue streams we're getting from the 99 to 101 digital plus all the others. We obviously need to take a look at its impact overall on jobs and business. Uh, I don't want to necessarily say it's gold in the gutter yet. Uh, but I certainly believe that there's a revenue stream that maybe the city can capture that doesn't have a negative impact on jobs. And maybe we can do it for the March ballot, but it looks kind of problematic if it's going before a committee on the 27th and it has to be done by November the 3rd. So I stand with Mr. Smith on this. A lot more homework needs to be done in fact finding it before we can take action. Let me just ask one other question of the city staff. Is that has any consideration been given to whether this impacts uh, our convention center? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Let me ask the city attorney. If, is, is, uh, with the issues that are going on with LA Live and many of their signs are entitled, but is this impact at all our convention center as far as their use of signage for uh, uh, their business uh, groups that come in and conventions? Well, I, I, I can't, Ken Fong for city attorney's office. I don't think it would affect the ability to use signage. But of course, if this um, tax initiative passed, then, you know, those, some of those, some or not, all, uh, if not all of those signs would be subject to the tax. But it would then go on, I guess, the bill of the, of the promoter coming in the convention center to pay that tax? Is yeah, that that's my understanding of how the tax works. Yeah, the, um, actually, the council approved some time ago a, a um, business deal r relative to signage at uh, LA Live. Th this wouldn't impact the ability to construct the signage. Now, whether or not they proceed with that plan or get, need to get new entitlements is up to them. It certainly could affect the revenue. So, in effect, you also had a speaker talk about development um, projects and relying on, on billboards. Well, the city could, like it does with TOT and parking tax, to incentivize development have this in play as well. So what at the end of the day you're going to have is an economic discussion about you know what the numbers look like if this tax has to be paid. But it doesn't have any impact on the ability to construct the signage. Let me ask you, Jerry, on, on the, the mechanics, uh, something has to be done at the council by uh, the 3rd of November. Right. But I understand that there's a time lag as to actually creating the documents and the substance, and is that true, or is that is everything have to be done by the third? Yes, the instruction to to begin the process ha has to happen by the third. I believe that the council needs to adopt the ballot title and resolution on or around November fifteenth. So we have about a month um, from now. Okay. You were <laughs> privy to all these discussions. Do you think we have any chance of creating the response to a lot of these questions before November fifteenth? Well, we can certainly address some of your questions. I, I, but you know, I, in terms of expectation on revenues, I know Mr. Rosendahl. I mean, that's a big concern. But as you heard here today, we 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 have the numbers from finance on on what the gross receipts are based on. And quite frankly, unless the billboard companies provide us with that information, you're not going to have it. And I think you heard pretty clearly they're not going to provide it. And I think this is our best guess uh, to date. 
uh, in terms of some of the issues about the impact on jobs and the impact on development, we can address mechanisms on how going forward, um, you know, that would fit into all of this. So some, some of your questions we can certainly answer, um, but I do not believe we're going to get a better estimate of what that number might be uh, in, in, uh, on a tax. Quite frankly, I don't know if we can get a better estimate in a year. Um, but the issue is for the council's involvement. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that some, if something moved forward on November 3rd doesn't mean that it's a point of no return. You still have to vote on the 15th as to whether it goes on the ballot. You, you do, and then I would have to check with the clerk in the county. But even after the 15th date, there is a point at which the council can decide to pull something from the ballot before it's printed. <clears throat> Uh, Chairman Parks, can I add something about the uh, convention center question? Yes. Uh, I want to remind you that I believe the existing signage on the convention center is on-site signage, and this proposal, this tax proposal, would affect off-site signage. Oh. Okay. Well, so, they, when you say so, everybody's when you say on-site, they're only advertising what's going on on the premise. Yes, they're exactly. not advertising anything beyond the facility. That, that's correct. But that will, that, uh, assuming they go forward with the signage proposal, that will not be what happens oh, yeah, they, going forward. Okay. Uh, there are si signage districts, Hollywood and the LA Library and others that where super graphics and off-site signage is allowed. That's right. Now, do we have an idea what the status of that is? Is that in our lifetime? The, um, the, the convention center uh, Fine district. Uh, it, it is. I think um, it can move forward, but part of it was waiting on the litigation. And as you're also aware, um, the council needs to take up the citywide replacement ordinance. Um, right now, there's the ban in place. So the council also has to take up the revised, you know, time, place, and manner restriction ordinance um, that needs to come forward. Okay. Let, let me see if I can capture. Uh, from uh, the comments of the committee. Uh, at this time, uh, the, this committee would not support uh, the movement of this item onto uh, the March 11th or March 8th uh, charter reform. But there are a variety of questions that need to be answered in the interim, and depending on how quickly that they can be done. If what I've gotten out of it is that we need to evaluate. Uh, uh, the issue of whether we it would be more feasible to increase business tax versus creating a new excise tax uh, as relates to this issue. Uh, also, uh, we need to identify the an amount of gross business tax that also is subject to sales tax uh, and specifically what that sales tax applies to. Uh, there is a need of an economic analysis to assess uh, the impact on large or small businesses. Uh, we need to also consider the impact of uh, this moving forward on uh, businesses that already have entitlements or in special use districts and also the contemplated convention center off-site signage. Uh, also we need to include the business community and those who are billboard advocates in this discussion. Uh, we need to have the input of the city attorney's office as to uh, the current litigation as to the, its impact. Uh, and then uh, we do need some analysis as to what is the true revenue stream that's created by these billboards. And so I think we need those issues in some form resolved uh, in some fashion uh, so you can have an appropriate discussion on the issue. Anything else, Bill? Now there's the law subject. I want to hear the mayor's guy tell us if it's a good idea later. <laughs> now, there's two things that are pending somewhere in the middle. <coughs> we had asked from this committee a while back, and we've not gotten the word back, is that we were concerned that uh, where billboards are placed, uh, property owners, it enhances the value of their property. Are we assured <coughs> that that enhancement is being retrieved in additional property tax? And we also were concerned that if a person is being given a weekly, monthly, or annual stipend to use their property for the placement of a billboard, are they also in our business tax system uh, as relates to reporting themselves as a business? So those are two side issues that we've asked a while back and we've never gotten an answer. So if we can have those also addressed. We'll look into that. Okay. So with those items, uh, we'll move that forward from the committee and it's going to the 27th on rules, 
with those concerns, but that it, if I understand the comments, that uh, at this time this committee does not feel this has been properly vetted and that we will send it to uh, rules with those comments and those concerns. Okay? Thank you very much. Okay, next item. <clears throat> two, right? I think we're going to uh, work backwards through the agenda and go to item two. Item two is uh, a status update from the controller on budgetary cash flow. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, just briefly, and I, I know you have a big FSR, and of course, I joined here today uh, by Matthias. Um, and it's been a whole month now, Matthias. Yeah. And we're very, yes. Please, this is his first uh, cash flow letter we've sent forward. I want to thank you for hearing this. Um, and as we have uh, last year, try to keep you up to date on where we are on, on cash flow. As of October 6th, um, general fund cash receipts totaling $777.8 million, approximately 15% of the total budgeted uh, with year-to-date receipts is tracking close to plan um, on that item. Um, we know in the FSR where you have the uh, about $63 million in some of the, the revenues, but for us our cash flow uh, is tracking close to plan. Disperse, disperse, excuse me, disbursements um, are tracking close to plan, but budget policy changes will likely increase those disbursements on a going forward basis. Um, as the year progresses, I will continue to monitor cash flow trends and report on any other additional issues that arise. Um, as the CAO highlighted in their FSR, there are still many uncertainties that come between us and a balanced budget. I'm still concerned, as I know you all are in this committee, because we've had some of those conversations regarding the anticipated receipts from the P3. Um, uh, and if those receipts are not realized before June 30th or at the level in which had been anticipated at the $53.2 million, um, that hole will have to be addressed. Uh, in the beginning of the year. As you know, 80% of our revenue comes in between January and June for our cash flow purposes. Additionally, we still have questions about our economic recovery. It is, if it's lower than anticipated, we um, believe it will have an impact on our city receipts, most notably the utility users tax, sales tax, and of course the documentary transfer tax. Based on the current expenditures of salaries, it is unlikely that departments will be able to absorb the $33.7 million payout for ERIP without the funds um, in the UB. I'm also concerned about the impact of uh, furloughing most general funded civilian employees, continued modified deployment plan of firefighters and the banking of overtime for police officers um, instead of making overtime cash payments. <clears throat> As you know, re increasing some of the um, approved exemptions for furloughs for civilian employees will increase our general funded salaries on a go forward basis. Um, at though, as these alternatives are considered, it is imperative that the budget cuts um, generate a like amount of savings at a minimum and also use of the overtime and managing of banked overtime must continue to really closely monitor the potential for overtime uh, cash uh, payments. Um, also, I think that um, what we put in the recommendations recently approved from our preliminary financial report really to stand by those, adhere to those recommendations, not only to preserve but to grow the reserve fund to the 5% to allow us to address any potential issues going forward. Um, and I think that um, we are concerned about any areas where we don't have the money, as we did last year, where we saw in January a huge dip and the concern having to get through June 30th and having to get to a very low um, uh, reserve fund at the end of the year and it not really seen as a just a, a um a borrowing of the, I guess being seen as a borrowing, not as a taking of the reserve fund as we get to the end of the fiscal year. So um, Macias is here as well to answer any questions uh, specifically on our, our cash flow um, yeah. situation. Let me just ask a couple of things. Is that uh, and you, I think, rightfully identified the same concerns we've had about the $53 million and And the issue is if uh, it's projected maybe the first quarter of next year. But the concern would be how long do you go forward without preparing that it does not occur. Because if you get hit with 53 million about April, that may not be a ship you can turn around. 
it's something like six million a month that uh, we're dealing with. So, is there a sense of when you have to start hedging your bets and saying you got to start making some of these six million dollar hits each month uh, while waiting? And if it comes in, you can all applaud it. If it doesn't, you've not allowed 53 million to be sitting there with a three month timeline. And I think and I'll let Missy respond as well. But as you saw last year, for example, we were doing okay, you know, albeit we had a reduction in our some of the property tax revenues, et cetera. And we when we started to see after November and December is when the I, I might have to say the panic started. Um, and so uh, we could probably survive a few months of a delay in a fifty three million and borrow from the reserve fund if in fact everything else was equal. But when you look at you know, right now, the ex I think uh, it's five or nine departments that have expended over their existing um, allocation, uh, at least tracking today, then that would be a concern if that goes forward. Uh, so it, it's kind of a, a, a tipping point. But, you know, I think that it, we would come back to you again after we see our receipts. By the end of this calendar year, we'll have a better idea of where our, some of those taxes are coming in to be able to let you know. Um, I think a $53 million today, if it didn't come in until May or, or June, we could, bar again, borrow with uh, knowingly that there's a tardy receipt of funds. We can borrow from the reserve fund to address our cash flow and some of the special funded funds. But if we don't know that. So there is a, I think it's April 29th is the tipping point as far as us being able to do it internally in uh, uh, identifying borrowing funds from the other and categories. One of the concerns I have is that that was an uh, item that even though they're going forward, the RFP was not unanimously agreed upon at the council. So you not only are dealing with the expectation of what dollars come in, when it's completed, are there going to be eight votes to say go forward, and yet you're burning six million a month in that expectation. So that, that's a... Yes. <laughs> that's I, why we highlighted it. <laughs> and I, I think on the other side is that uh, although that money, some of that money has been put aside for um, the uh, some of those payouts in the UV, uh, it doesn't appear, at least in the first FSR, that it's sufficient to cover all of those issues that we're confronted with. It's kind of a, a junior shared responsibility this year that... Uh, <laughs> That, uh, it's, 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 it's the shared sacrifice, and as a, you know, now as a general manager, in essence, of a department too, we know we're having to look at um, dealing with all the ERIP payments out and vacation, um, and then additional furlough days that we're having to pick up because they've come back. So having to address that. So we, we know uh, firsthand as well that it is difficult to assume all of that um, within each department, and that that UB will be tapped um, particularly. And then we'll I think we we are, we are, we are I'll say it's, you know our department is able it looks like to assume all of that responsibility at this point in time, uh, but it is because of having to adjust that um, in, in our own budget. And when when we could, could we expect your next report? Uh, well, uh, I'd say probably in a couple of months uh, we will be coming back um, at the end of October with a report, uh, an update on the reserve fund loans or reserve fund advances that occurred at year end. So you will be hearing from us at that point, at which point we can answer any questions you may have. Um, so that's, uh, reserve fund advances? Uh, yes. I think otherwise on the cash flow, it's probably the beginning of January that we would know again the receipts from the, and, and the CAO would be tracking this as well, uh, from uh, property tax. Uh, yes. Just one question. Have you had any discussion <clears throat> with the tax collector regarding uh, property tax delinquencies? Are they predicting an even greater increase with that complete collapse of the foreclosure market on the four major banks? Right now, go ahead. Well, no, I haven't had any conversations. Yeah. I think, and the CAO may be able to, because they've had some additionally um, thus far has been tracking. Um, we haven't seen a huge uh, decrease. Yeah. Uh, but uh, my concern is just a few weeks ago, the four major banks announced there's over a half a million foreclosures they've got to stop right. because they screwed up the paperwork. So the expectation of those people that are in that mode that may have been trying to pay and may have paid their property taxes would be, I'm not paying anything because they're not going to foreclose on me. Uh, so I'm concerned that this may have an uptick in the, uh, uh, the delinquency rate at the county level. I don't know, Ray, have they mentioned that to you at all um, in there? 
It would be, you know, I mean, one of the concerns we had last year was the fact that um, in, a, in a normal year, and my numbers will be a little bit off, but the magnitude is such that normally you'd have 16,000 people that might question their reassessment. Mm -hmm. uh, I think last year they had in the range of 60,000, which, which means not all of them, you know, will necessarily um, be correct, but that was a big change from what they'd had in the past and how that would affect our, our revenue coming forward. Uh, so I think this is the same kind of issue, and we'll work with the CAO to, to talk to the county as well to see if they've done any yeah, yeah, you know can come back to later with that but I think it's something we ought to look into yes and yes and I, I would agree that that the collection rate is something to keep an eye on okay. um, that would also impact you know the sales of homes as well so yeah. at some point it are would there any being sold I, <laughs> yes according to these numbers or not <laughs> yes but that would impact our documentary transfer tax as well yeah just dovetailing on that uh, you know November 1 you have to have half of your property tax in November 1st in the city of Los Angeles. Yes, and you have until December. December, December. December something till you're late. So <laughs> you're late. I'd say most people send but November 1st is the first cutoff point when you should pay or not, and then the late time. December 4th. You, <laughs> yeah. Will you have any <laughs> sense of payment day. <laughs> is December 1st? December 4th. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we can ask the crowd, how many of them pay on November 1st? Because we just got them the other day, I know. Either way, um, I got mine, obviously, uh, for part of it. And, it. and frankly, it didn't go down at all. And, and I will predict that there will be people who will be unable due to financial realities, uh, and they will protest it. So I, I agree uh, with the controller that the number of protests is going to be increased this year even though it's too late, uh, they're going to do it, and they're going to have issues trying to figure out how to make payments. So I, I think that's a real point that needs to be dealt with. But I control, you mentioned that eight or nine or some figure like that of the departments aren't living within their budgetary um, um, parameters at the moment. Uh, do we have a dollar figure about That's in the, this? the CAO's report. Um, yeah. So I think they'll be able to report that in the FSR. Um, we had been closely just so you know, also uh, looking at um, the CAO gets from each department. Here's how much they're spending yeah. each month. So they have right. a good with their analysts for each of those. What we look at um, are some of those departments that um, things that they had actually um, purchased or costs that they then don't pay for till after July 1st. We've been mm -hmm. trying to work very closely with that mm -hmm. so they can uh, report on that as well. Um, <clears throat> there's a few departments that have, you know, um, that delay their payments until the next fiscal year when they have the money to do that. Um, and that'll be part of the report that they provide to you. Mm -hmm. uh, but we wouldn't necessarily know as much as to those departments that are <clears throat> each month how they're spending. The CA will be able to do that and we have the overall with, it's within the budget. Yeah, do you think they're going to get in compliance or you think they're playing around or what? Well, we look forward to that discussion for the next item, but yes, we've included a couple of recommendations to address some of those shortfalls. Okay, it, it's why it's so important in the F, when I was sitting on your side of the table too, the FSRs are so important because you have a better idea early on as to where if the departments are going askew as to where they are in their budgets and particularly this year as you look at each department being asked, as we are in the controller's office, to take care of e payment, you know, vacation and the furlough issues. Um, that is something that, uh, for some departments that thought maybe they were in line, now will not be because of that. So I think um, now's the time to begin to address that as we're in that first quarter. Let me so we'll on, on your report on the paragraph number one. What was uh, what was being referred to when you said, like the third sentence from the bottom, that recently approved budget policies uh, changes will likely increase cash disbursement on the go forward? Yes, yeah, so those would be the the exemption, the furlough exemptions that have been granted. All right, that's and the then, AAH stuff. Okay. Yes, and then it, you know, would be other items like if you know the, the modified deployment plan for firefighters, if that, that were not to proceed, um, that would also impact impact uh, future disbursements. And I think the other, what I mentioned, the other one is the exemptions on furloughs, because there's been some review of which departments have, again, exemptions on furloughs. Unanticipated, I think, in the original budget. Okay. Anything else? No. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And for clarification, is the committee recommending to note and file the controller's report? Thank you. <laughs> Very 
Oh, you're getting settled. Do we have Mr. McQuiston coming here on item one? Council, yeah. Jim McQuiston. As you know, I don't just look at the budget. I also try to get into the individual departments. And I am very, I could say this is a Casablanca movement. I'm rather shocked at the way these cuts have been made in some of the departments. And you know that already. One of the things, though, that I did want to say right now, as far as the first FSR is concerned, I call it an FER because I think it's important. Now we're trying to enlist the neighborhood councils to make sure that people realize these are estimates. And we don't really know if these things are true, but they're the best that anybody can estimate at the time. And I believe that they are good estimates. But if we're going to involve more people in trying to control our budgets, I think two things we ought to do is, first, we should ask the CAO to call it an FER. And also, I think we should also make one of the columns a little clearer. One of the columns shows the total budget. The next column, I believe, shows how we're doing to date on the budget, what the budget expected we would have to date. But it's not very clear to someone who is not a budget expert exactly what that column is. And then the third column is how we're actually doing. So I think these minor, you might say, typographical changes could certainly help people analyze these things. And we need all the help we can get from people who are outside. In my experience in the past, I've had to direct people through several departments. And always it's the lowest member who comes up with something which everybody else missed. And they're not necessarily experts, but they do look at things. So I think those would be something that this committee should ask the CAO to do in his report. Thank you very much. One thing before we get started in the FSR, I'd like to at least start this meeting with just a little discussion about from the CLA, CAO, and if we have a city attorney to discuss an issue of once a budget is approved, what is the appropriate way that it can be altered? And can it be done by hallway conversation or telephones, or does it have to come back through the process in which it was approved? Because I think when you go through the FSR, there's a number of things that appear that department heads or guidance given to them have ignored the direction of the budget process. And now we're into the fourth month, and they certainly don't have the wherewithal to close these gaps, but they've created them for other people to resolve them. And it just concerns me that we get a document that goes through all this review, we vote on it, and then you find after three months that individuals have decided what they like to do and not like to do, which I don't believe they have the authority. And we just want to get a discussion on the record as to what is the authority, what is the process, if the budget is approved by the council, signed off by the mayor, how do alterations get made on the budget? So who would like to start that? The CAO? I'll just start off and I'll let Sharon jump in, or even Karen. Certainly back in May, the budget was discussed, put together, and adopted by both mayor and council. And as we proceeded in implementation this year, there were a few actions that perhaps were not initiated in order to carry out the savings or programs, et cetera, that were adopted by both mayor and council. It's my understanding, and certainly you need to have the city attorney here as well, that it takes, you know, in order to modify that budget, you do need action from both mayor and council. 
Um, certainly, Council, you control ultimate position authority and appropriation authority, and so when there are changes that affect that, then that, uh, as far as I see it, that falls under your purview. Um, so somebody would have to propose something that would come come back to back you to the council that the, both the mayor and the council would have to approve for a subsequent if, vote yeah. if, if, if you're going to not implement the budget as it's written or if you're going to alter i would assume if you're going to alter some major part of your organization you just don't do it on the sense of prior council decisions you have to bring that forward also that's my understanding okay. We, we would concur with that assessment that uh, anything um, over a certain amount, a dollar amount, I believe it's 50 some odd thousand dollars, does require both mayor and council approval to actually move those funds. And it is our understanding that once a budget has been adopted, whether the funding is for a particular program, that that funding will be used for that program concurrently. If funding isn't provided for a particular program, that program shouldn't be continued if that funding isn't available. So um, we would agree, and I believe Mr. Echevarria has just walked in as well, and we can certainly ask Mr. Echevarria to weigh in on this, but the charter is fairly clear with regard to the expenditure of dollars and the approval authority of the council and the mayor to um, um, have those departments expend monies in accordance with the budget that's been adopted by both the mayor and council. And the assumption then is also if you need approval, that you'd also need approval not to activate the budget. That's correct. Okay. And Pete, did we get... Uh... Pete. Pete, there's Pete. You've answered this 300 times, Pete. You don't need to be brief. Thank you. It's been a lot. <laughs> Could you give us, give us what is the, the legal authority once the budget is approved to alter it? And once it's approved by the council and signed by the mayor, what is the process and what is the legal uh, background to, to create the ability to change the budget or not to the same, I'm activate sorry. the budget? I think I understand. The same process as it, as it was to adopt it. With, with very small exceptions, and those small exceptions are those that the Charter and the Council through ordinance has implemented for making transfers. Uh, the, the Mayor is given authority to approve transfers up to a certain amount, $35,000 in some amounts, and in instances and in, in others, $50,000. Other than that, the authority lies with the Council and the Mayor to approve the budget as it was adopted. The same process applies. And also, as I mentioned before you sit down, the issue of people choosing not to implement what's in the budget. Is that also an issue that has to come back to the council and mayor to agree not to implement something that's been approved? With with very narrow exceptions, that, that would be true. That is to say the budget provides authorization for the expenditure of funds just in the manner in which they are uh, authorized by the mayor and council. And uh, the, the narrow exceptions are to respond to emergencies or, to, or for elected offices. They have more flexibility with, with the assignment of their staff as well. Uh, but for all other departments and offices, they are constrained by the limitations that are placed by the budget in terms of the funds that they received and the, and the purposes for which they are to be expended. Is that somewhere that authority is in the charter? It's in the charter, yes. And I'm sorry I didn't bring it with me. Okay. The thing is, I would like, because we, oh, you have it there, okay. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, and I don't know the appropriate way in which we either put it in the committee report or whether we send a letter to each general manager to explain to them that uh, the budget, as Greg Smith said, is not advisory. It's actually the budget. And when you're directed to cut positions in the budget, you're to cut them if you're, if you're directed to fund positions, you fund them, but that you do not have the authority to ignore the budget or do something contrary without going through the process of approval. And that's what we want to make sure that it's clear that we don't go through all of this work to get to the budget completion and then find that there are individual decisions made that people just didn't bother to implement. So that's what we want to do. Not, and let me ask Sharon, what would be the best? Is that a part of the committee report, or would that be a letter directed to each department as to providing that guidance? Or? 
We could handle that either way. way. Yeah. yeah, whether it's committee report, you can actually include in the committee report to instruct us to prepare that letter and send it on your behalf as well. So whatever you prefer. Let me let me ask that as the first ask of the day. If you could prepare that as part of this committee, that uh, the 10-11 the budget should be implemented as directed unless it's gone through the proper price process of being altered or changed through the council and the bill. So if we can ask you to do that. And we can work with the CLA to Give us the in right the drafting of that letter. Language and all that other so that FSR 2, maybe we could have some of these things implemented that we thought were implemented back in May. Sure. Thank you. All right. With that, we can get the FSR. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Yeah, we can get started and, and so that we don't go back and forth. If you can just kind of roll through the report with your overview, and then we'll get to the recommendations and, as we've done in the past. And that way we could ask questions per page if there are things of concern. Great. Thank you. Because I, I would perfect. I'd like to give you an overview. We could certainly lay out um, sort of where we've been and, and where, where we are and where we need to go. Uh, as you know, this is our first uh, status report for the fiscal year, providing you sort of an overall uh, picture on where we are. We do provide a little bit of an update uh, on the three-year plan for uh, financial sustainability. Uh, certainly this is very important. Uh, it's something that we've been discussing over, over the last several years as far as getting down to sort of the, the root or basis for our budgetary problems. Um, in the areas of, of salaries and benefits, pensions, uh, employment levels, and then also certainly our, our revenue shortfalls. You know, the goal here has is, is been uh, to sort of pursue four uh, initiatives um, that then we can put in place, adopt, uh, and mitigate uh, our deficits uh, both in the current year uh, and as we go out uh, over the next several years. Uh, and as we look at the four-year outlook, certainly we need to uh, continue to pursue and implement these initiatives in order to bring down that, those uh, structural deficits and the, and the gap in the out years. Those, just quickly, those four pillars um, called for building uh, basic responsible fiscal management, um, building the reserve fund, focus on our core mission and services, um, and this through the elimination of departments and consolidation of functions and, and services, uh, development of public-private partnerships, uh, and also the last one being our workforce modernization. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the challenges that we have both today and over the next several years uh, really are, are significant and, and really we need to continue this path in order to address those uh, and move us forward. You know, the, the deficit for this year, uh, as we have uh, presented in the report, is roughly about 63, almost $64 million. And then if, as we go out, into 11-12 that jumps back up to uh, roughly 318-319. So the measures, the uh, austerity measures that we put in place um, over this beginning in March of last year have, have certainly have helped us, um, have put us uh, on the, the path, uh, though we still have a long ways to go. And in this, some of these measures, uh, we talked about the elimination of a couple of departments. You know, we have the furloughs, service reductions, uh, concessions uh, that we've been able to reach with our bargaining units uh, have really have helped us. Uh, if you recall, at some point last year, we were uh, we had a, a deficit of well over 500 million, um, and through a number of these measures, um, along with taking a little bit of money out of the reserve fund, we were able to to close uh, the fiscal year. So since March of, of last year, we've had a number of layoffs. Uh, there's been a number, uh, several hundred employees that have been transferred from general fund to the special funds and proprietary departments. Um, and, then, and this all comes on top of the over 2,400 uh, EREP folks uh, that have gone over the last, uh, basically in the last latter part uh, of last year. Many of the solutions that we, that you adopted last year um, in order to, to deal with the current year budget Roughly about 40% of those were put in place as we moved into 1011, and certainly they they were those contributed in order to get us uh, to a balanced budget 
and, and get things in place uh, for as we move forward. Certainly, we are going to continue to uh, look at our, our compensation structure and uh, through uh, our deal with EAA, uh, is started to address some of those uh, issues in relationship to uh, employee health and uh, making some modifications um, that include some cost sharing measures, you know, increasing uh, the co-pays, things of that sort. All of these are, are, put us on, are putting us on the right path in order to bring down uh, our compensation, overall compensation uh, within the city. And, and as you know, or, or certainly you uh, are well aware of, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be putting forth a number of proposals. And I think this, this week we're going to be talking about some pension reform measures. Uh, it's very important for us. And so these things um, we're getting out on the table, and so we can have a good con uh, discussion. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can get some approval to address the out year um, shortfalls. So now, now we're, it's October um, 2010, and we started the, the year uh, with the balanced budget. Uh, as uh, the prior discussion um, sort of alluded to, uh, not all departments were uh, able or implemented uh, some of those, their respective budgets. Um, there have been other things that have happened um, that are sort of uh, put us in uh, out roughly about that 63, 64 million. We've had uh, just a few, you, we have some delays and layoffs, delays in the implementation of the budget actions. Uh, we have the ERIP and other benefit payouts. Um, we've also had some changes as far as the furlough structure. Um, in general, there's, there's a, like you mentioned, a handful of departments, uh, city attorney, DSD, ITA, DOT, um, fire and police, uh, that do have some sizable deficits that we're going to discuss in just a few minutes. Um, most of those are related to salary accounts. We do have a few expense account shortfalls uh, as well in fire, GSD, and police that are contributing to the overall deficit. So we do include uh, a number of tables to present that information. I think table two uh, in the report lays out in sort of rough categories what contributes to the 63 million, 64 million. We have the sworn overtime salaries of about 15 million. ERIP payouts of 14, uh, other salary costs um, close to 14, expense accounts uh, roughly 10 million, and then uh, due to the reduced furloughs of VA, it's, it's roughly about 9 million. Uh, and then lastly, we have the coalition deferred sick time payouts. Uh, we do want to caution everybody that most of the expenditure data is based on the first couple months. It's just August. I certainly have a long ways to go. There will be a number of changes uh, that will happen to occur uh, over the next several months. It is obviously the beginning of the year. And so as employment level changes, uh, payroll costs um, change, so forth, uh, there, there certainly is a potential that many of the deficits will, will come down slowly. Um, though uh, we are concerned, being given that this uh, we are only a few months into the year, and the $63 million, uh, we don't want that to grow any larger. Um, and there's a number of things that uh, we need to discuss uh, that, will, that are going to contribute either you know, as positive or negative to that number. We do have some, some savings, or I should say some pots of money that, that perhaps we can draw on. Uh, these, uh, the, in the UB, there is the, um, the ERIP money. Uh, there is the uh, the bridge money in the UB that's roughly about, it's $10 million, but you're going to have a recommendation coming forward on SMS that's going to take roughly about $1.7 out of that. And then at this point, there's roughly about $2 million uh, that's been identified in human, human resource benefits to help close uh, the gap. I think for those departments uh, that we do have uh, large uh, problems, uh, we are going to ask or we do recommend that those departments come back in 30 days and, and lay out basically an operational plan on how they can mitigate those shortfalls um, uh, and basically come in balance through the end of the year. The, the one um, portion we would like to exclude, and I should say include in the sense that uh, where we feel we need to find money is, is, is for the EAA uh, furlough reduction since that uh, there was a, a savings or a give on the health side, um, we feel it would be appropriate for, for the city to find money to make departments whole for those. Um, 
And like I mentioned, I believe that's about $9 million or so. As far as the 63, uh, that's on the expenditure side. The, the other piece that uh, I, I believe we're going to talk about uh, is the $53 million in revenue related to the P3. Um, at this point, we're moving forward. Hopefully, we'll have um, concessions uh, that are, will be presented by a number of, of firms. Uh, we're going through the solicitation process, and hopefully by November, December, we'll have um, some proposals to put on the table, and hopefully by the first quarter of, of the calendar year 2011, we will have uh, something to put for you, before you, for uh, approval or adoption. However, uh, if that does not go through, that 63, uh, you need to tack on another 53, and you're, you're getting upwards of 110, 115 million dollars um, that we would have to deal with. As far as the the revenue side, overall we're we're actually uh, on close to budget plan. Um, we have uh, what I'll call a few ups and downs, uh, but overall we're tracking well. Uh, we do provide a number of tables um, and charts in the report that give you a sense of where revenues is going. I think most of, uh, like I said, overall we're doing well. Um, when the budget was adopted, um, uh, I think the most economists assumed a little bit uh, higher growth uh, in a 3% range or so uh, moving forward. However, six months down the road now, we're seeing things are not quite as rosy. Uh, as we had thought, and many uh, of the economists are a little bit more pessimistic uh, than we were uh, several several months ago. You know, we're looking at uh, continued uh, double digit on our unemployment rate, and that certainly doesn't help our, our economy, uh, both in our taxable sales, retail sales. We're looking at our homes um, and the, the growth in, or I should say lack of growth in the medium uh, prices in homes. Um, we, we certainly are seeing a, a slowdown uh, in some of the economic activity. Um, some of the positive, I will say, are, are certainly our property tax up this uh, slightly, but we're seeing some positives in our gas users tax and, and our TOT. Um, this is certainly good, and it's going to offset some of the, the shortfalls that we're seeing in our dock transfer tax, um, some of the sales tax, some of the electric user tax, and so forth. So. I think lastly, what I'd like to highlight is, is our um, four-year outlook and the deficit for 2011-12. Uh, right now, it's it's 318. Uh, we know that it certainly will change. Um, it looks like pensions will be changing their uh, assumption as far as the return rate, dropping that from eight to seven and three quarters. Likewise, Lacers have gone to a seven-year smoothing, and that's going to change the numbers as well. Finally. So with those, we're going to have a little bit of positive news, but on the flip side with the pensions, that's going to be a negative. And uh, once the actuarial reports are completed in mid-November, we'll have, we'll make some changes to the outlook to reflect those, those changes. So uh, the reserve fund, uh, certainly uh, as reported by the controller, uh, it, we are in a much better spot than where we thought uh, during budget adoption. Roughly about 174 million um, as it stands now, with 120 in the emergency and 53 plus in the contingency. While we're we're close to 4%, uh, we'd certainly like to get to 5% for our policy. Uh, and uh, one of the recommendations that we do have is, is certainly when it comes to balancing, uh, we we would like to make every effort to balance within internally to either departmental savings, things of that sort. We would like to continue to build that reserve uh, as we go forward. It's very critical, both as we uh, has given, given us a pot of money to borrow against, it also um, is viewed favorably from our rating agencies, and certainly in the market, uh, certainly assists us, assists us in getting favorable right rates when we um, borrow uh, on the market. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Melissa to provide any details and anything I missed. No, I think you got it all. <laughs> Let me, Thank uh, you for, for bearing with me going through those. We're going to uh, put this on the DVD and play it from later this evening. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me just ask uh, colleagues, on the uh, Ray gave us an overview of the first eight pages. Let me just, uh, uh, before we get to the recommendation, the one thing that uh, it concerned me is that although we're projecting 63 million, we're concerned about the 53 million 
and we're looking at $300 million next year, we write this report and said we're not going to make any adjustments now. And it just seems inconsistent with all of these things. And then when we followed up with a paragraph that says uh, the economists are very pessimistic about what's going on, you know, I, I know you like excitement and rush to the, the end of the line and do it all in one month, but it just seems like <laughs> we're putting ourselves in a real bind with all those things in front of us to not piecemeal this each month, each FSR, to start addressing some of these points. And so I'm just wondering why we took the tack of no adjustments with all these things in front of us. So uh, two things. I, I would like to sort of on the web. Certainly um, folks are, are much more pessimistic um, now than they were six months ago. Um, we took, I, I think, with your assistance, took uh, a very conservative view when it came to our revenue. And uh, we do believe that the estimates are, will hold. Overall, they will hold. Um, even um, with folks saying now, you know, GDP is going to be, you know, uh, close to 2 percent through the end of the year, perhaps rising over to um, beginning of 2011. Um, the revenue, we, we believe, you know, setting aside to 53 will hold um, as is. And one of the things now on the expenditure side um, and dealing with the, the 63, which I should say um, caveat, which doesn't help our argument, uh, that, that certainly can grow. Um, I know we're going to have a discussion regarding fire right now. The 63 includes the, the 13, but given the path that the department has um, been put on, uh, that 13 can certainly grow quite a bit more. And, um, double and perhaps add another 17 to it. One of the things um, that we have offered as a, a recommendation that won't deal with the whole thing, the whole pot of money, um, but we'll deal a portion with that, and that involves the EREP payouts and, and sick leave, the deferred sick leave payments from last year. Uh, we do recommend that departments work to absorb those payouts. Um, that's, uh, that will go a long way in, into dealing with a portion of that 63 but it's nowhere near the remaining. Um, that's, that's where we'd like um, the departments where we recommend those departments that have the large shortfalls to come back with some operational plans within 30 days um, to come up with some solutions. The other thing throughout the report, you used the term um, the departments that were um, over budget, uh, that they were delinquent, some were delinquent in their layoffs. You know, I was wondering, because we talked to personnel that they don't have anybody in the queue. So I'm wondering, did they did not Im implement the layoffs? Are these uh, are people still in positions that should be laid off? Or just what does that phrase mean? I, I think we were concerned, or we had um, anecdotally, we had heard that a number of departments perhaps um, didn't proceed quickly uh, once the budget was adopted and looking at their staffing looking at their resources and, and trying to balance the two of those. And uh, if, if some of those, that analysis had been, had been done perhaps a little bit faster, then some of the departments may not be in quite a bad a shape as. Is our assessment now that they've actually moved the people that should have been moved? Uh, has that been resolved? I, I would like to say I think we still have some concerns that there might be some department that still haven't moved everything in order to try to bring themselves in, in line. Because one of the things, and, and we'll get to it, we'll get to the department, but one of the department's uh, general services appears that they're holding on to people waiting for a grant, and but they're creating liability while waiting. And if the grant comes through, they can move them, but they have no ability to close the gap that they created. And, and so those are the kinds of things that concern me, and that's why I started off by saying, you know, when we're asked to implement the budget, we should implement the budget. We can also bring people back. But to just hold on to people knowing you don't have the resources uh, just seems to be counterproductive. Is that what your sense is? is you know what, I think my general sense is, you know, the city has gone through quite a bit of turnover the past year. Uh, you, you look at, as I, as I actually sort of mentioned a little bit earlier, we had the EREP. You've been moving people from general fund to special fund and proprietary departments. Um, we've started sort of this layoff process last spring uh, towards the end of um, you know, winter. 
And, and that's, that's some huge steps for the, for the city. Uh, we've never have done that type of position or, or, you know, position elimination, employee movement, um, as far as I know, uh, in, in the history of the city. Um, and, and, and that's, that's hard to swallow in, in many sense. And, uh, you were taking steps in order to move quickly. Um, it can be, it, some, it takes us time. It takes the city time, unfortunately. Um, and so that sort of contributes to sort of the position that we're in right now. What is our best figure of number of positions that we've cut? That we've cut? That we've cut? Yeah. Oh, that we've cut. Well, we had roughly about 3,500, uh, there's 3,300 positions that were in the budget, but we certainly have cut over the last several years more than that. Hey, ben, do you know? Do you recall? And then, and then we have the 2,400 ERIP. ERIP, that's correct. That, that wouldn't be a part of the That was part of the 3,300. It's part of the 3,300. And then, Maggie, could you come and tell yeah, us like where four. we are on layoffs? I think. Yeah, Maggie's here. So, but roughly, I think about 4,000 positions certainly well, over the last several years. Okay, of which 2,400 were the EBRIP. Yeah. And then on the layoffs. Actual layoffs, 374. We've had 743 transfers, and we also had 131 canceled layoffs. 131 canceled they are. Right. Now, when we say transfer, that could be special fund or proprietary? Just uh, proprietary or special fund. So we've moved, we've, we've downsized by about 3,500. Now, are there any still in the queue or have we? No. Yeah, we've, and all the EVRIPs are resolved and all of the layoffs, so there's no, nothing in the queue. Is, That's correct. Okay. Now, any pending transfers have not been resolved? Uh, we have some pending transfers, but they're moving along. It's pretty fluid. I will have to say that, for the most part, uh, our transfer opportunities are, are drying up. So there, there aren't too many more uh, opportunities to move people to special funded. Okay. And then, Ray, let me ask you, on, uh, when we look at the... Uh, deficits in the department, uh, and I kind of drew a line on, at least on my chart, that when we talk about overtime and salary costs and expense account, those appear to be within the purview of the general manager. But on those that we're dealing with EVRIP and EAA and sick time, those appear to be things we've imposed on their budget. Yes. And so in looking at why. things that they have control over, so when we put the money in the UB, were we looking more at the EVRIP and the sick and the furlough as those being paid off? That's what that money was set up to? Originally, yes. That was the, the money that was set aside in UB for the EVRIP was just for that, was to, to basically make those payments um, for departments. And then there was additional money that was set aside for the budget balance and bridge. That was roughly about uh, 10 to 13 million. We had another pot of money, about 13.4, for uh, human resource benefit costs. So that was what did it come out? A little over 30 million or something? Um, it was rough between on the general fund for the um, budget balancing bridge and the EREP, where we were talking about 34 million dollars, more or less. Do you have any questions on that first eight pages of the overview? <coughs> Melissa Krantz, Office of the CAO. The discussion section begins on page 18. What's that now? We're going to go to the recommendations first. Uh, did you want to go to the, recommend, the controller instruction recommendations or the... I thought the, you start on page 9. You could do that. These um, controller's instructions are discussed in greater detail in the discussion section. 
So I thought we could start there because okay. it encompasses also recommendations that are included on the attachment. So it's a little more thorough in the discussion. This goes with page <coughs> Okay. So uh, page 18 starts off with the status of departmental budgets. Uh, that opening section begins with highlighting our um, concerns about the departmental salary deficits, and that's um, approximately 38 million attributed to civilian salary counts and about 15 million to sworn salary counts. And we also mention a uh, potential for several million in back pay for uh, settlements. And in that same section, we make a, um, multi department recommendations. Uh, one is for uh, those departments that we highlighted in the summary section. Uh, that would be the city attorney, fire, GSD, ITA, police, and transportation departments to prepare operational plans to address their deficits. And the reason why those particular departments were um, singled out is because their deficits exceed those were, which were just the benefit payouts and the um, EAA furlough reduced savings. The other uh, recommendation is for those departments to um, absorb payouts. This is for all departments to absorb coalition deferred sick time payout and ERIP retiree benefit payouts as possible. So, uh, did you want to go through all the departments or just those with deficits? If, you can, if we can just go by page. Uh, okay. Uh, may, committee members may have questions on different departments uh, on other issues, but we can just go by page number. Okay. So, questions. Okay. So, page 19 is the aging department. Uh, that department has a 370,000 special fund surplus. Um, they are seeking to fill positions, and as of the last Managed Hiring Committee, I believe three positions were approved. Um, there's also mention of the delays in the state budget and the impact to cash flow for its uh, programs, for which Council approved $3.6 million in uh, loans from the Subordinate Loan Special Fund and Public Works Trust Fund. I'm just curious about any unexpended grant funds will be returned to the grantor after the end of the fiscal year? That is correct. Uh, are we looking at, what are we looking at? Uh, you know, I, this estimate was done back with August estimates, and I believe they just received uh, permission to fill three vacancies, so this will be, have to be updated for the next estimate. My bottom line is I don't want to return grant money if we <laughs> can help it, right? Right. So that would be our goal is to... Uh, That's correct. And then the, uh, that is in the last sentence of aging. Yes. Are, are we pretty well guaranteed that reimbursement? Yes. Uh, yes. This is more. This is a cash flow issue that is just waiting for approval of the state budget. The governor has signed the latest version. Uh, there were, he did veto some, so I, there's a potential that it has to, you know, still be uh, work out some of the details of that state budget. But we do have an update at the end of the report on the but state we're, budget. But we're guaranteed the, the funding that we're expecting. No, that's what I've heard, yes. I haven't heard anything contradictory to that. All right. okay. uh, the Animal Services Department has a projected deficit of 178000 And just in general, most of these uh, salaries general deficits for departments are attributed to absorbing ERIP payouts or EA reduced furlough savings or the coalition deferred sick savings. And those departments that I will call out that have expenditures beyond that, I'll, I'll call attention to. Okay. Um, there's a recommendation uh, to move some of the contractual service savings that were identified as part of the 10 percent budget reduction to their salaries general account to address some of the deficit. The building and safety department is going to be completing the year within budget, uh, assuming that they receive recommended transfers, but there is a potential revenue shortfall of five million from the non-compliance fee. Uh, this is the um, foreclosure fee. Uh, building and Safety notifies that property owners can avoid payment of these administrative fees by demonstrating that they're trying to comply with the maintenance provisions. And they also note that um, they also have insufficient staff to monitor the program even if um, the fees could be assessed. Let, let me ask you, how did we finalize the budget now? I think it was one time there was discussion that there'd be as much as, what, 20 plus million dollars coming from this and we reduced it down. but. I Do we have any idea of whether we, it appears we're not even going to get the five million? It appears we're not going to even get the five million. I think at one time the estimate was well over twenty million. Yeah. It might have been three times that as okay. originally proposed. What's the budget show? Um, five million. Yeah, so we won't get any of it. And and I, I guess one of the things um, there's five million for for this, and there's another six million for doc transfer. There's a sort of a it's not a two one for one, but it's a corresponding um, entry in the UB of 11 million that 
includes those items. But uh, did we, uh, did they keep people on the budget waiting to use this $5 million, or was this, was this just going to impact their own overall service? I mean, they didn't keep resources based on this uh, dollar value. Yeah, no, no. This was an entirely new proposal. Was that going to just go into their special fund? Um, uh, I think it was general fund money. Yeah, so it had to be counted somewhere in there. Yeah, I think it was, it was general fund money. I think that these were revenues that um, were proposed to come in during the budget. I, I believe that the coalition actually brought some of those revenues forward. Um, originally, the Budget and Finance Committee, in adopting the budget, had suggested that those monies, if they came in, would be put into the Budget Stabilization Fund. Um, when the council actually adopted the um, a budget, they actually recognized $11 million in the UB. So if the monies don't come in, it's not going to affect the budget. It's just that those monies would not be available for service mitigation reductions. I'm just curious on that one point, not, not with you, but with building and safety. It says that the department notes they have insufficient staff, and you mentioned it, to monitor the program, even if the fees could be assessed. That is correct. And I I believe someone from Building and Safety yeah, was going to come. I'd love to that because if, if, if somebody, uh, you know, can generate revenue more than their salary, um, obviously we like revenue generating employees. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, Frank Bush with the Code Enforcement Bureau, Department of Building and Safety. Um, as was mentioned, this wasn't uh, proposed, the five million wasn't proposed by us. The foreclosure ordinance that went through um, did not have any um, staff, along, you know, provided with it to monitor the foreclosed properties. There was a motion that was put forth um, that uh, by Councilman Garcetti, which was to look uh, for the departments to get together and look and see what, you know, how much it would cost, what kind of fee could be charged on these foreclo uh, foreclosed properties. Right. We are responding to vacant. Uh, buildings that are open uh, on a regular basis. We get any complaints. We get complaints about trash and debris on them. We continue to respond to those. Um, and we, uh, there are a number of reasons here with, within this ordinance why we will not be able to uh, go on the uh, work, uh, assess this fee. Um, there are provisions within the ordinance itself that uh, allow uh, the uh, property owners to bring it into compliance that would keep us from being able to assess that. And so we are not doing monitoring of foreclosed properties throughout the city of L.A. Um, with our existing staff, there is no way that we could do that. And if you did monitor them, um, do you think there's a revenue stream or not? If, if a fee is established for the, um, each of the foreclosed properties that are registered with the foreclosure registration with the housing department, uh, we would then be able to uh, get that fee to pay for staff. Mm -hmm. So can we look into finding out that and seeing if we can do that? Or is yeah, that's part of the motion that I mentioned yeah, that there it's in the process and, yes, yeah. it's uh, coming up. How do we move quickly on that at this point? Um, I don't know exactly what the status is when it's coming to Plum. I know that there's been discussion that it uh, should be going to Plum in the near future. Um, the direction was for the departments to get together, city attorney, I believe, um, CAO, CLA office to get together and work on that. Do you have any sense of when that could happen? Um, certainly, we'll we'll jump right out and working with the department and all those affected and try to bring this forward. Uh, one of the one of the difficulties of this is when it was full, you know, presented and, and thrown on the table, it, there were just a number of issues that weren't right. flushed out. It was yeah. it had a long ways to go on this, but. And I think the issue, as we said before, if it came to being, it was good we can consider it for the stabilization fund, not necessarily to buy new employees or additional employees. One thing I was going to ask you, and this is another report that you're working on, that uh, in dealing with, uh, we gave them, I guess, 22 unfunded resos. Now, we're monitoring to make sure that those are not funded, or are they special funded, or... How are we going to address that? Because that was concerned during the budget hearings about having extra bodies and looking up that we're hiring people that we can't afford in the long term. The department does have 22 unfunded resos and eight unfunded regular authority positions for a total of 30. Those positions are currently vacant um, and we're still working with the department. The goal was that if they were to able, they were able to achieve revenues in excess of uh, the projections, we would allow them to fill those positions. As of right now, they are currently vacant. And I think the message we gave during budget was that 
for short-term blips in the workload that we're not going to hire full-time people? Correct. The department is looking at things potentially as needed authorities, potentially hiring additional 90 days, uh, utilizing overtime as applicable in order to deal with those um, situations. Okay. And then uh, the other one I just want to comment on is that I guess uh, tomorrow at personnel committee there's a proposal for 19 new positions in uh, building and safety that deals with what greening? Uh, that's correct. The, the state has come up with a new uh, green building code and uh, the city will now be mandated to enforce that new green code in order for the enforcement mechanism. The department has requested 19 positions and an associated fee. Okay. Let me just give you, a, are you going to be there tomorrow for personal? Uh, yes, I will be. Let me just give you a question if you could resolve it for me before you get there. Uh, from reading the report it appears that rather than create 19 positions to do greening inspections, it would be better served if our current inspectors were taught how to inspect green buildings. And so that uh, that fund, those, those dollars that come in, rather than have two sets of people inspecting parts of the same building, you'd have inspectors that can inspect all of the buildings. And oh, it that makes too much sense. <laughs> so that will be my question on the 19 is whether that money should be used to enhance the existing inspectors rather than cre creating a superstructure with assistant superintendents and all that other stuff to handle the green ordinance. So that's question one through ten. Okay. <laughs> Nineteen. Okay. 19. okay. It's only part A of the question. <laughs> okay, so any other questions on uh, building and safety? Did you want me to go through the transactions or just skip to the next department? What's that now? We have some recommendations yeah, for building and safety. Yeah. We have 600000 from the repair and demo fund for code enforcement services. We have $2.1 million from the building and safety permit enterprise fund for incentive sick vacation payouts from the, for the ERIP <laughs> program. We have a $1.4 million transfer to uh, reimburse the department for salary, OT, transportation expense, and related costs for their agreement with LAWA. Okay. okay. Uh, the city administrative officer, we're reporting that our department will be within budget. The city attorney is one of the departments. Did you have questions? <laughs> the uh, city attorney's office is one of the departments that's reporting a significant deficit that we've requested an operational plan to report back within 30 days. Uh, their shortfall is currently estimated at 11 million, of eight, which 8.3 million is attributed to uh, their various salaries accounts, and they have an additional 1.2 million in expense accounts. Um, if you took out these expense, the absorbing the EAA reduced furloughs and the payouts, their overall salary shortfall is about 7.1 million, which may be reduced by an additional 2 million uh, after attrition. They're hoping to identify um, some internal savings to identify, to address their bar due shortfall. And the litigation expense account deficit of 958000 it, it does include assuming uh, the transfer from the UB. So even after you transfer funds, they do have to address this deficit. Okay. So any questions about the discussion? Let me just ask, on the sense of the report backs, the operational plans, how do you intend to do that? You said 30 days that we'll be back to this committee? Yes. Okay, because I'm just wondering whether uh, their timeline should be shorter, because I think the way it's written is that they report back in 30 days, or I'm sure the CAO is going to have to massage it or something. So I'm just wondering whether we need to cut that time shorter for them so that you can be back here in 30 days to the committee. Um, certainly, the, the sooner that we act and, and implement anything that comes out of the operational plans would be better. Um, so if we can we reassess that 30 days and determine whether they should be reporting to you within 15 days and you're here before the committee no less than 30, you know, no more than 30 days, we can then take that standing uh, operational plan report uh, in the committee and on to council. Okay. So that's a great part of the 63. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, we have recommendations to transfer 50000 from the UB Outside Council account uh, to cover outstanding invoices for worker compensation cases billings. The adopted budget provides $2.25 for this. 
And then we have a recommendation to transfer 122000 from contractual service savings to the salaries general account to partially address their deficit. Let me ask, is anybody here from the city attorney's office to comment on their budget overage? <laughs> See what happens, Pete, when you stand yeah. in the side. You waited too long. <laughs> waited too long. <laughs> Sorry, who could comment on what aspect of this? The, the uh, approximate $11 million shortfall, of which I think about $7 million is salary. And uh, okay. the issue is we're going to ask your department to come back within 15 days to the CAO so we can have a report here in the council, uh, in the committee. In committee in 30 days. That was our understanding all along, that there would be a report. Any ideas on how we can make uh, uh, impact that $11 million shortfall? Well, we're looking at, at even uh, higher attrition than we uh, than we otherwise would have had. I think uh, we're looking also at moving still some positions to special funds and uh, also some revenues that we'll be talking to the CAO about and we'll talk to this committee about as well. Okay. All right. So if we can uh, ask that that uh, within two weeks to the CAO and work with them, and then we could have it here by 30 days. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the Community Development Department is, I'm sorry, I skipped the city clerk. The city clerk is uh, projecting a $143,000 deficit, and we're going to monitor expenditure accounts for potential savings. The Community Development Department is uh, within their budgeted funding. They uh, have revenue of $12.4 million projected for a full cost recovery of all filled positions. And um, we're going to determine uh, the available funding to fill additional positions. Let me ask you on that first, second paragraph on the CDD. Mm -hmm. uh, when will that occur as far as the uh, related costs? Uh, the related costs are transferred as expenditures are uh, incurred. So there's periodic uh, transfers. Uh, as far as the R grants? Oh, for the R grants? That one I don't know. Can we report back that? We'll get, I'll look into that and get back to you. Okay. Okay. I wanted to know when we're going to be getting the R money reimbursement. Um, Taylor from the CEO's office. The related costs for the IRA grants are also transferred to the general fund as they incurred. So the um, CDD does a costing for all their positions and the related costs incurred per the funding source and transfer the amounts to general fund. Now, is there going to be any shortfall or do we, are we assured there's going to be sufficient funds from ARA to get all of the... Uh... For, for, for the current year, yes. We're not sure of future years or just? We're working with the with CDD on the um, sources for the up for 11, 12. So we're not quite sure what those uh, resources would be at this time. But for the current fiscal year, they have enough funding. Okay. Okay, for uh, recommendations, we have a transfer of 20000 to Department of Transportation's overtime account for the first mile, last mile transportation study. We have a transfer of 5000 to DOT for design and construction work for the Pico Washington Street Skate Project. And we decrease appropriations to GSD for unspent funds for the Rancho Cienega project. We have a transfer of $4,576 uh, in ARA funds for computer purchases. We uh, correct an appropriation by 23000 for the housing department. We have a transfer of 164000 to the street services for the Pico Washington Streetscape project. And we transfer 54000 uh, to the four family for source centers. Uh, the controller's office, we're protecting they will complete the year within budget. Uh, that assumes that they uh, Receive uh, 2.2 million in MICLA money for their FMS project, and that there is some assistance for uh, the e reduced EAA furlough savings. Um, as we mentioned in the discussion, they have been reporting that their um, ability to complete audits has been adversely impacted by uh, furloughs, layoffs, and E-RIP retirements. Let me ask on the uh, 2.2 for uh, FMS. Yes. Now you mentioned earlier it's like 1.7 that's going to be added to that for uh, SMS. 
Yes, yeah, certainly. Hopefully by the next couple of days, a report that will go out um, requesting uh, some uh, funding actually out of the UB, of the budget balancing bridge of roughly $1.72 million. And so that is would be on top of this 2.2. Additional funding for the account receivable, a part of either one of those figures? No, this is um, the 2.2 is, is FMS as a whole. Um, the 1.7 is dealing with SMS the, and the interface between SMS and FMS. But I thought there was something talked about a while back about the account receivable. There's another six or seven hundred thousand dollars. And that's already been squared away. Okay, that, is that part of the 2.2? Uh, or is that above the 2.2? There was a reappropriation yeah. that was uh, recommended at the year end closing for that. Okay, so that means we, this is from their issue. department? I'm sorry. Where what? do we get the funds? The uh, I believe I, I would have to look into that. I don't remember the source of funds. Actually, those funds are not part of the 2.2. Uh, okay. Where, no. where did we get this, this money for the account receivable? Um, there was a year-end reappropriation, I think, of approximately $500,000 at the end of last year. Yep. Those funds were reappropriated to this year. Yeah, so there are two pieces. One that was the reappropriation, the other piece was additional MICLA funds. Okay, so this, this but those were over and above the 2.2. So this thing is approaching five million dollars. I mean, that we're adding. To if it, you if you look at that. the total picture regarding the whole, you know, FMS I mean, and, air, and all related. Yeah, we, we don't want to go back two or three years. What we've already added. This is just. Current or recent, we're talking about almost five million dollars. If you look at the expenditures for this year, yes, okay. and that didn't even well. Yes. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. You want to add something, uh, Jacob? I should see. I just want to point out, two point two million dollars is not additional funds. It's funds that were budgeted as part of the ten eleven budget, and the action here is simply to move. Those funds, which are authorized through MICLA, through MICLA financing. Oh no, I, I, we understand that. The issue was that this was money, additional money back in the prior budget, that was going to be added on to FMS, and now we're doing 500,000 for account receivable and 1.7 for SMS, and it just keeps growing. It's up to five million, not what we've spent before, but we're adding about five million dollars to it. But the, the new pieces are. I mean, based on um, from budget adoption are the AR piece, accounts receivable, and then, yes, this additional piece that, that will be needed for SMS. Okay. All right. So, I mean, and this is mid-year? All of this will be done mid-2011? Well, the, the uh, AR project, I think, is slated to come, you know, be implemented by September 2011, assuming we're on schedule. And then the SMS piece, the resources that are being requested, are, are really to deal with the current year and to help build the interface between SMS and FMS. And as you'll find out shortly with the report, that we hope the 1.2 will, that's all that will be needed. But when, when, S, when FMS comes online July 2011, SMS will also come online? Well, SMS is the system we have now, yeah. currently. You're going to interface. But yes, there's some interfaces that need to be developed and tested. We have some, some other cleanup that needs to be done as well this during this fiscal year. So let me go back again. Will <laughs> they all come up at the same time in July of next year? If there are some risks, but the hope is yes, that when FMS goes live, that SMS will be in sync. No. I put a question mark. <laughs> Okay. Well, I expect we'll have a robust uh, conversation when the SMS report comes forward. Now, the one thing about the comment that came out of the uh, Audits Committee, I thought we had a separate budget that dealt with audits, didn't Because we rolled some money over each of the last two years. Their so, audit yeah. money is part of the overall controller budget. Okay. But I was wondering when it said that they were lost people and were dangerously close to not being able to imp uh, effectively implement their audit program. I thought that money, we rolled over two years in a row. Well, we took some money um, that was not going to be spent from last year and, and it was reappropriated into the current year. 
I think probably what the controller is, is referring to are the actual audit staff. The internal staff. Okay. All right, the uh, Convention Center is projected to complete the year within budget. Uh, they have about $2.2 million in special fund revenues to offset a portion of the related cost for this year, and they've transferred 550000 of that already. Um, last year, they completed the fiscal year above budget, so uh, we're recommending two of their requested transactions um, for the purchase of parts and supplies to repair various plant equipment, and that's 139000 and 199,000 for the per to pay for costs related to air quality mandates and replacement costs for lighting systems, poles, and hot water boiler gas devices. Let me just ask on that last sentence under convention center. Yes. When we said that we're going to, uh, it's recommended that the remaining appropriations be held. They had some other transactions that were requested that uh, were not considered urgent, so we're not included at this for this FSA. I'm just wondering, is that part of the, the 500000 that they saved? Yes. I mean, when you say not urgent, I mean, is this something that will allow them to function as a... Uh, the uh, the analysts determined that these were the most urgent items, and I, you know, I'm not too sure of the stats. I'm, yeah. I'm just wondering if they have saved 550, mm -hmm. and they have a, a list of things they need to run that business. Why would we hold back some of the money? You know, let us get back to you. There, there may be with moving forward with what was recommended uh, already that you know, that work will take some time, and so the next what I'll call next, um, you know, to-do list um, would come later on, but let us get back to you. There was also some clarification that uh, they wanted to hold back some of the recommendations just to ensure that they met their revenue target of $2.2 million. So, you know, as so we get further, point. yeah, so once we get further on in okay. the fiscal year, we can better assess that they're meeting their revenue target. That's okay. Let, let me just ask two things. I think we just did a motion asking that you guys evaluate the flexible parking policy. And so we certainly would like to see they've given that tool uh, so that just as we've given them the flexible rental policy. And the other one, uh, they are uh, less able to be competitive because of the current system that they can only hire electricians that are time and a half electricians that work for general services of the DWP as opposed to going to the hiring hall. So that adds time and a half for their electrical work. And so we need to see on those two things how we can get them some relief uh, so they can continue to be uh, competitive. Uh, we have two requested transactions for council. We have a reappropriation of 12000 to pay for invoices associated with community events in CD15. And we have a transfer of 88000 of uh, uh, various council discretionary funds to GSD for the purchase of parking related equipment. For cultural affairs, we have a 227,000 deficit projected for the department salaries general account. Uh, in prior years, they've used reimbursements from the public arts program to address these shortfalls. And that is possible this year, but however, these funds could also potentially be transferred to the general fund to reimburse the department's related costs. Um, at this time, we're recommending uh, that 93,000 be transferred, I'm sorry, that be a reappropriated and unencumbered matching grant funds for the Cultural Exchange International Program. And what's the five substitute authorities? I'm sorry, what? The five substitute authorities that are listed there for 300,000? Uh, my understanding, I'm not too sure of the status of this um, report, but uh, they have five substitute authorities that our office has reviewed. Oh. Claudia Aguilar with the CAO's office. Um, the department currently has five unfunded substitute authorities. We could not, um, based on council's instructions, we could not approve them because they didn't have uh, sufficient, another position of equal value to hold that position. So at this point, those are un unfunded, unauthorized positions, which um, two of those positions were but, um, positions that were deleted as part of the budget, which weren't subsequently laid off, and the other three are more of a long-term um, issue within the department. So they used to be able to use some of the grant, not grant funds, but the uh, public art reimbursements to um, use that, but because of additional savings that they've been asked to absorb, 
they may not be able to keep those positions employed any longer. And they're unfunded and unfilled? No, they are filled currently. And how are they dealing with that liability? That's part of what the shortfall. So we were able to do some transfers, and we're currently looking at their special fund schedule. We do have some funds in there from prior years, but we're still trying to get down to whether or not those appropriations are actually backed by cash to be able to transfer in to assist with this deficit. Good afternoon. Saul Romo for the Department of Cultural Affairs. We do have some unfunded positions. We have been working with the CEO's office in trying to clarify how we got to the position where we got some unfunded positions. We did implement the layoffs that we were supposed to last fiscal year. We were one of the first departments to implement layoffs in April. We implemented a second round of layoffs in June as well to comply with the budget process. I think what we're looking at here is there was some confusion as to positions that were vacated through ERIP that were previously unfunded that, for lack of a better term, were double counted. There are some positions that we were holding vacant because they were swept from the department's budget that we were using to hold substitute authorities. And as the rules have changed for the subauthority process for the authorization this year, we've been working with the CEO's office to try and see if we could find the resources to make sure we could get through the year with these unfunded positions. If we can't, we're monitoring them closely. We will come back to you in the mid-year FSR with proposed transfers from our public art process to offset the deficit. And if not, if need be at that point, we will implement additional layoffs if necessary. Okay. Now, it appears that the CEO is already talking about transferring those to the general fund so that we're not double counting. It looks like the public art funds may be spoken for. So we hope by mid-year you've resolved the ‑‑ We actually aren't making a recommendation on that. The transfer docs are sitting in our office, but because of the high dollar amount, we didn't feel comfortable signing them until council made the decision whether or not. In the past, the department has been allowed to use those funds to continue their staffing. It's kind of a revolving door. But with the current climate, we didn't feel that that was something that we could make that decision. And we understand that we have been aggressively pursuing those transfers back from the public art projects. We understand that they potentially may be transferred back to reimburse the general fund, and that's why at this moment we're monitoring this closely. We're working closely with our analysts because by the time we get to the mid-year financial status report, we'll have a better indication of how the CEO is going to make a recommendation to your committee, and at that point we'll make an appropriate recommendation how to address our deficit as well. And in addition, those funds are one‑time funds, so that's one of the considerations that we're considering. Even if we can fill the positions for this year, unless the positions are added back in the budget, it's going to be an ongoing ‑‑ No, that's my concern is that we not keep creating the liability if there's no expectation to fund it towards the end of the year. Yeah. So if we can work with the CAO on that and make sure that ‑‑ We've been working very collegially on this. All right. All right. The disability department is projecting a $43,000 deficit, and at this time we're recommending transfer $20,000 in identified contractual service savings to their salaries general account to partially address it. El Pueblo is projecting a $50,000 deficit in salaries general. We're monitoring other accounts for potential surpluses to offset the deficit, and the department's rent revenue is currently on target. Didn't we just transfer $50,000 for an issue on salary shortfall? That one. In the last ‑‑ Claudia Aguilar again, CAO. We had money left over as part of the year end, so that was from last year's funds. We had about $70,000 left over. We used 50 of that for the special events funding. The shortfall is based on this year on having the various payouts, so it's two separate ‑‑ Remember now, it's the special events. Yes. All right. Thank you. The emergency management department is projecting a deficit of $775,000, which would be almost entirely offset with the receipt of approximately $758,000 in Homeland Security grant reimbursements, and we are recommending transfer of some identified contractual service savings to their salaries general account. The employee relations board is projecting a deficit of $20,000, 
and we're going to be monitoring their contractual service savings account for potential savings to offset this. The Ethics Commission has a projected deficit of 196000 but is would be uh, remedied with a further transfer if recommended from the special prosecutor allocation of 250000 The Finance Department has a $1.2 million deficit projected, and that assumes that uh, no additional vacancies are filled beyond that approved by the Managed Hiring Committee. Uh, the department has, however, expressed concerns about its ability to um, collect revenue uh, based on its hiring levels. Uh, we are recommending transferring uh, 300 sorry, 3,427 in identified contractual service savings to their salaries general account. You know, we really need to have some evaluation on, I mean, if there are primary revenue producers that, uh, that we I just don't know if we can hold them to the same line as managed hiring, uh, because every every position in some way is a revenue producer, and so we just need to figure out how do we give them the resources that they need if they're going to generate 400 and some odd million dollars in the budget. This is, I mean, this is not a new discussion. We've had this discussion before, right. and I think we instructed them to go <clears throat> see or go ahead and fill those positions. So. Have they been held up in managed hiring? The, I'm sorry. That was going to clarify that the write-up itself was just referring to the finance department's request to be exempted from the managed hiring committee process. But in the meantime, have you been holding up their authorities? Most of the authorities, when, when it comes to the investigators or the tax compliance officers, have, have gone forward. Uh, we are having a discussion regarding their accounting clerks right now. Uh, where we would like them to look at other models other than just um, going right off the list and hire new people off the street, trying to come up with some sort of a, a hybrid plan um, to, to basically do some of their, their, their processing. Uh, we're also hoping that they can further look at some automation initiatives that they can put forward. But as you mentioned, we've had this discussion before. We kind of had this discussion in committee you know, last year. You know, they've been carrying subs authorities for a number of years. Um, you know, they've had the salary savings rate. Um, there weren't really any additional dollars given to them to, to address some of the things. And so now we're sort of in the same, you know, boat, so to speak, where, you know, they, they want to ramp up full staffing, but yet they just don't have the dollars. But, but um, the things that you're recommending, is that going to be something that could be done during this fiscal year? Is that going to create? Of new classifications and is that like a long-term issue? Is as far as the automation piece? No, no, the other ones we send different classifications of, of personnel. Um, I'm sorry. Well, as far as the, the like the investigators and some other things, those have, have been approved through managed hiring. Uh, but I was referring to some of the accounting activities, the accounting clerks, and, and whether they can. Further automate or look at some contractual services options to deal Let with me, some Can of we do that during this fiscal year? We are having that conversation with them now, yes. Because one, one of the things, and Karen's working on a, a motion for us, that we really like to see how we can work out where they are off the general fund, that uh, we fund them by, the, by a portion of the money that they generate, not money that just comes in, but the money they generate and find a way that, that allows them to keep generating money seven days a week, you know, every minute of the day. So, in fact, where are we on that? Well, we're working on that. You'd requested uh, that as, to have something in place before the before the budget yeah. is presented. With regard to the accounting clerks, I, let me just back up for a second on managed hiring. The, the positions that are identified as revenue producing generally are approved through managed hiring. Uh, the, the accounting positions are a little bit a little bit different. This is this is actually a broader issue citywide because there are, uh, all we're doing is moving people around. Um, when it comes to hiring accounting clerks, that's an entry level position. So then you're at a, at a point of just determining whether you should increase. You know, you're, then you're hiring new new folks. So some of this is being balanced out, which is why looking at some other options so that finance can do what it needs to do. We can balance out some of the, the, so the deficit issues. On, on FMS also is that so many accounting clerks That's are correct. missing citywide. 
Right. The, the, the accounting classification citywide is, a, is an issue because so many people left through the ERIP program and they're only, they're limited resources and they're just moving around from department to department. All right, but if we could look at, see, before the, we start the budget process of how we can construct a budget for them out of money they produce, I think that would be something, because even though we may not classify them as revenue producers, when they move a revenue producer to fill in for a non-revenue producer, it's the same result. We, we have one less revenue producer that's uh, collecting money. Right. So if we can get, get on that before the end of the year and carve out some way that we can get them off the general fund and, and that they know what their budget is and operate uh, with that budget for the fiscal year. I don't know if we can really get them off the general fund. I mean, what they it's going to be a general fund no matter how, no, no, how you I launder mean, it. Yeah. But, but I, I guess the, the one question um, or request that we would have, certainly as we discuss this next year, their budget in committee, that we have the full discussion. And if there's a desire to give them if they need $100, then we give them what they need. Because yeah. you know, over the last couple of years, we've been having this back and forth, and is yeah. having well, able to get. When I the general fund, I just mean give them a budget and let them run for the year, as opposed to all the nuances we place on them, and then we come totally back agree. and say totally. we we uh, we can't collect the money, and uh, they they are a very vital part. If we're going to do all of this uh, commission stuff on finding revenue and all that other stuff of BTAC. And yet, the, the central part of collecting money isn't fully staffed. It just kind of dissipates itself. So that's that's yeah. what we look at when I say off the general fund. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Okay, the uh, fire department is one of the departments that we're requesting for a report back on an oper with an operational plan. Right now, their deficit's estimated at 13.4 million. Uh, this is attributed to their sworn overtime constant staffing account and the field equipment expense accounts. And it's, we should note that ongoing labor negotiations and other staffing adjustments might increase this deficit by 17 million. Now this is one that uh, I'm pointing at with the letter. And I don't know if we can do this, but uh, I, I'm gonna ask that we direct the fire commission and the chief of the fire department to implement the budget as approved by the city council and approved by the mayor. And that means the two key issues is the EMS captains and going back to modified staffing. Those are $20 million hits. Hmm? And I was going to say, and hazmat. Yeah, hazmat. That's right. Well. The things that the budget clearly authorized should be implemented unless there's a proposal that comes back to default. Yeah. I was just going to say, I met with the chief and the president of the commission just this morning on this, and they're bringing back a proposal to us. I just uh, had a communicate from Mr. Uh, Garcetti that he's holding off the discussion tomorrow that was in council on MCP for two weeks pending the chief and the commission bringing back that very whole, that, that whole uh, laundry list of issues and, and their plan to balance. So, you know, we can send them the letter. I think we should just say to the, to the fire department, let's wait a couple of weeks and that they're bringing that all back. And I think Eric sent me the date. In fact, I, I don't remember. Anyway, two weeks from now or so, we're going to have the whole thing in council. I'll hold my yeah. frustration. Yes. But at this point, <laughs> yeah, at this point, uh, is the mayor's uh, press conference event uh, mm. impacting the budget? Yes. Gee. You betcha. It's about six months. Well, it started today. Yeah. 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 So yes, you have rainy weather and all this and that. Yeah. And yes. Yeah, we got to have those firefighters out there getting, knocking down the. I just want to know if, if we're really fires. looking at an additional <laughs> hole that was created by that strategy. Well, yeah. the thing is, this is that when that's when a 17 you, million. It's about 17, a 17 million dollar well, hit by not implementing the budget. Well, let's say it's, it's 13 plus another plus potentially another 17. Well, the thing is that if you're preparing for the fire season and it rains, <laughs> you probably shouldn't be paying constant staff. <laughs> That's just basic. Again, too much logic. So if we can alter what I said earlier and ask them to come back with that report within two weeks, that we will address their overall budgetary balancing act. Um, as we mentioned previously, there's a pending lawsuit estimated to cost uh, several million in back wages. And we have a couple transactions. One includes the recommendation to reappropriate uh, 200000 for their e-commerce program. 
uh, transfer 258000 in MICLA funds to reimburse ITA for communications installation work and to transfer 341000 in contractual service savings to their salaried um, overtime constant staffing account. The uh, General Service Department is our third department that we're requesting an operational plan from. They have a deficit of about $12 million, of which um, $8 million is for their salaries general account, and uh, $4 million is from their parts account. Uh, the projected $4 million shortfall is for the field equipment expense account, and this is because the um, budget was reduced by $2.9 million uh, per the budget package to eliminate 2,000 fleet vehicles. Uh, that hasn't occurred yet, um, so the equipment should be eliminated during the last quarter of the fiscal year. There's also a potential deficit in the petroleum account. However, there is money set aside in the UB for that account, and as long as gas prices hold, we should be fine. Uh, there's also discussion on the street services ARA support. Uh, right now, only GSD staff charges directly attributed to project delivery are eligible for ARA reimbursement at this time. Um, so there's uh, some issue that needs to be resolved there. Uh, depart the department's fleet services related costs to support ARA projects cannot be paid uh, for this year and may not be reimbursed in the future. So the department is incurring general fund deficit to, to support ARA related expenditures. We have several transactions uh, recommended that includes transferring 160000 from the department's hiring hall to Salaries General for two building operating engineers. We have 84000 reappropriation of MICLA money approved last year for uh, installation of equipment and police helicopters. We have 742000 in energy conservation loan program funding uh, from the Department of Water and Power to purchase and install energy efficient efficiency measures for city buildings and facilities. We have 86000 from the same fund to reimburse labor costs for replacing fixtures with water conserving fixtures. And then uh, one of our key recommendations is uh, to authorize general services to purchase 48,000 vehicles <laughs> as part of the MICLA um, placement program. They made this request last year as part of their year-end report, although we asked them to go back and see if they could identify additional funding. They have uh, said that they've applied for um, a potential reimbursement of 500000 in grant funding that is eligible for that. Let me ask you, what would happen if they didn't implement the $12 million vehicle program? Because one of the things I'm concerned about, we're talking about reducing 2000 and then we're going to buy some at the same time. I mean, I know we can't replace on, on the street sweepers that's but the other vehicles is there a way that with the reduction of the fleet that we're not getting rid of some and then going buying brand new vehicles that could be transferred uh, my understanding that uh, GSD came up with this list and it was reviewed by our office for the um, the useful life and these uh, vehicles have outlived their useful life and therefore they need to be replaced what but, but I mean the, the issue is we have a department that's what is it 11 million, 12 million in, in the deficit and uh, some of the, I mean, a lot of things are going to outlive their useful life before we get out of the, this budget crisis. In fact, some of us on this committee. <laughs> so. uh, Claudia Aguilar with the CAO. Um, we spoke with GSC, and the, the vehicles that we're including in this list are vehicles. At this point, they're working on the study to determine which vehicles are going to be taken out, but already they've determined that these vehicles will not be part of um, the fleet depletion. They're construction vehicles, um, trucks, and sweepers as well. So they are not sedans. Um, and I can understand sweepers. I just don't know about do we need to be buying trucks and all the other stuff if we're depleting the fleet until we know that we've actually depleted and then we go back and figure out what we need. Well, and then th this is what, um, part of what they have determined our core services. There was also another request for an additional $12 million based on 1011. We held that request. Um, until such time as the study comes out, but we felt that these were um, critical. Let me just ask on this, what's the debt service on the 12 million? Um, over the 20 years, generally a debt service you're looking at about uh, about 90% or something of the amount, so it'll be of an additional, yeah. I mean, this is from my um, experience as debt group, I mean the um, municipal facilities, but generally we look at what's the about 90% of that. But let me just say this. We will replace these vehicles three times before we pay off these. 
I mean, I don't, I mean, just. Well, well, normally we match up the useful life of the vehicle along with the, the debt service schedule. So we don't take I mean, if take we go a, 20 years, we'll, we'll replace these vehicles at least twice and maybe three times while we're still paying for the original vehicle. That is, that is, well, no, no, what we will do, I mean, we'll, we'll not go out 20 years. We'll match up the useful life with the term of, of the debt. I, I think that part of it will increase the amount, annual amount on the debt service. I'm sorry? That will increase the annual amount of the debt service if you shorten the term. It, it will, basically based on the payback schedule. The, the, I believe the issue here, and, and from what I understand, is there's a, a number of vehicles that need to be replaced. They've gone past their useful life. There, there is some savings by getting some of these vehicles off, sort of out of service. You know, if you look at sort of the parts, um, you know, the, the, the sense that these vehicles are breaking down frequently, the, you know, the tires, all that good stuff. And now when we buy vehicles, like that. <laughs> what's that? I used to write reports like that. <laughs> <laughs> and some of these vehicles need to be upgraded for air quality mandates, and so you don't really have an option to run the vehicles that you currently have. Okay. And I was going to say, one of the advantages of actually going out and purchasing these vehicles is I, GSD tries to do a good job in, in, in securing via our warranties, buying extra set of tires, things of that sort, and help us out on the, the parts and account. Let me just ask if, if you guys can give us a evaluation of that item, that $12 million item. What is the, uh, the timeline? What is the cost if we don't do it? What is what are the impacts? Because uh, that's a lot of money when we're want just two or three items before that. We're saying get rid of 2,000 vehicles, and then we're talking about spending $12 million on other vehicles. And, and before this all over, many vehicles will be outside their useful life and will be, you know, a lot of things. And so it's just a matter of what, uh, you know. We'll follow up. I, I, I asked your same questions. And so if we can look at that one and then the, uh, let's see. Uh, and then the other one is just their overall uh, uh, personnel budget. Uh, we, we projected uh, before the budget was through that they were well over uh, deployed. And they're still well over deployed. I mean, and, and, and the, the, the problem is we're now saying that there are about 406 positions they need to cut between now and, I mean, immediately so that you can get the savings for this, this fiscal year. Had they done it July 1st, uh, we'd, they'd be in less severe issues. And then, you know, we keep hearing about this uh, retrofit program that uh, going to fix 100 buildings and $34 million, but nobody knows where the debt service is coming from. They're holding another 40 people to do that that they can't afford, whatever. No. Um, if I can clarify that, the the, the 40 positions that you're discussing are the those are actually with the grant. They are training. They're not being held. They're being paid for by the ARA grant. Okay. So those are not. Um, they're not on the city payroll. I know, and, they, they're being trained to do something that we may not well, have the money to do. And also, may, they're being trained to work out in the private um, field as well. And we are working on that report and hoping to come back to you um, within the next couple of months on that program. But in addition to um, the shortfall for the department in terms of their salaries. Uh, uh, I would say I think we've estimated about only about a million of that is in fact related to the layoff, um, the delays in the layoffs. A lot of it has, we have been moving um, the positions back to special funded positions. So I, I think it's, um, we're working with the department very closely, monitoring it and. But something's got to happen very quickly. And, and the 400 positions actually assume that the department would not be receiving the money from the UB. It assumed they would be absorbing a lot of costs, which now, um, the city may, so that that was more of the, um, if they did not get the money from the UB that they were budgeted UB, for. I think we could all say it's going to be exhausted. Well, no, this is money that was already set aside in the UB. I know, but it was yeah. set aside for several different reasons. I mean, and, and we have a tendency to change the label on it as the year goes on. And so any department that's $12 million over by October uh, has to do some internal squeezing form greater than what we can give them. I mean, so that's the whole thing is that July 1st, this should have been in place. They should have been moving on this July 1st. So. 
I would just like, uh, Val Maloff with the Department of General Services, I would just like to clarify a point on those 40 positions that um, have been mentioned a few times today. Those positions were funded through the Energy Conservation Grant. Um, we received the grant funding um, be well before we actually had to um, lay the positions off that um, ultimately ended up being transferred into that program. Um, that program is a two-year program, um, and once the grant funding is gone, uh, unless we can absorb those positions in some other way, some routine way through our workforce, they won't be with us anymore. There's no obligation. What for the about city. the other positions that's creating the overage? The other positions that are. The, I think what the report is trying to do is to say, look, GSD has a $12 million problem, and we actually need to lay off, or we would have to eliminate 400 positions to break even mm -hmm. by the, at the end of the fiscal year. And so um, we, you're right, we have been working on how we're going to deal with this problem basically since July. Um, we'll be coming back in our operational plan with some ideas. You know, we're looking at our core functions and uh, reprioritizing, now that we have a, an idea of where we've ended up with all the reductions, we're reprioritizing, we're looking at ways that we can, um, we're looking potentially to eliminate some kinds of services. We're also looking at our accounts very closely to see whatever kinds of savings we can come up in our expense accounts and elsewhere. But we need some urgency because yes. the issue is, is you get closer to the end of the fiscal year, or end of the calendar year, this 12 million will keep going up and up, and the, and the pain you have to exact on your workforce is going to be significant. So we only have eight months this year to actually start saving well over a million dollars a month. I, you're right. Okay. And uh, that will be back in two weeks with an operational plan. So if, you, if we can get that, because we, we have assessed and looked, but we really need to find dollars and start cutting it off the budget. All right, housing is projected to complete the year within budget, and we recommend a transfer of 30000 from a community development block grant funds to cover their ERIP payout. ITA is the fourth department that we're requesting an operational plan from. Uh, they have a deficit of $5.4 million projected for their salaries accounts. Um, we have several transactions recommended as well. We have 128000 transferred from their contractual services to salaries general account to pay for a senior communications engineer. We have a transfer of 67000 for Channel 35 from Channel 35's expense account uh, for a council phone voicemail technician. Uh, we have a 500000 transfer in MICLA authority from the department to the police department because they will be taking the lead in the development of their voice radio system for the EOC. We have a transfer of $3 million in MICLA funding uh, for salaries for the FEMIS project, which we discussed earlier as part of the controller's recommendation. And that's for um, the departments, uh, for ITA, controller, and CAO. And then we have a recommendation to appropriate 51000 from the revenue accounts for uh, CSR, I'm sorry, communication service requests, uh, mostly for the Department of Recreation and Parks. Hey, I, on this uh, ITA, is anybody here from ITA? Almost got out. <laughs> uh, I appreciate the um, 67000 for the LA City View Channel 35 council phone and voice mail. It was very, um, very necessary. But right. you know the politics we went through through the budget process. And I remember. Sent and, you know, the customer and all that. Are we looking at that going forward as we get ready? Because the recommendations that I wanted to see was that Channel 35 and 36 get adequately covered within the funds generated by the cable customer. Uh, and the percentage, there was roughly $25 million altogether, of which we were going to try to take more than sweeping it into the general fund. Are we looking at that as we're proposing the budget? Yes. Um, in response to Councilmember Park's request that we propose a, f a percentage that should be devoted to cable and uh, channel 35 operations that, yes, would be the percentage that remained with those activities and didn't get uh, used 
diverted to the general fund we are coming up with what we think is the appropriate amount for those those activities ok i look forward to that report when do you think we'll get that we plan to submit it with the budget great if we can get it before the budget yes it would be very helpful sure because the issue is is that we want to get away from that sixty forty sweep we want to and the other thing we talked to the general manager about was that public access is greater than thirty five thirty six we may need to consider whether public access includes some of the things that city clerk and other things that we rely on that we're constantly trying to figure out how to fund but we need to give them a budget as opposed to here's forty percent we'll sweep it before or after so right we're working with the city attorney to see what they think is an appropriate definition of public access and we look forward as Mr. Parks was saying prior to going into that budget ok ok the uh, library is projecting a three point four million deficit for their salaries general account um, and we do want to report that there is poss there is funding within their um, within their fund for a future transfer it's just not uh, recommended in this report we have also a deficit of ninety thousand in fines and fees and revenue and right now we're recommending that one point nine million be transferred from the various special accounts to the salaries general account to pay for the cost of ERIP retiree payouts deferred sick time and other benefit payouts is there anybody from the library here talk about this What I want to know from the library standpoint is there's been talk among some potential benefactors or donors to support a vigorous volunteer program that could complement uh, employees. Um, and uh, we appropriated, I think, a half a million dollars in the budget process to explore that. Um, it would be my hope that we could go back to uh, seven days a week uh, if we can get a very viable volunteer program plugged into the partnership with city employees. Do we have any awareness of where we might be on that at this point? No, I would need to speak to some of the library department and report back. Okay, it's important that we early on in this process figure out how we create a volunteer pool that complements uh, in a partnership way the city pool with the hope that we can provide library service. And I, I take the same position when it comes to Rec and Park. I can tell you of several parks in my district where on weekends, and it's for Rec and Park just to hear, I don't want no park closing down on a Saturday afternoon at 3 or Sunday afternoon at 2 or something like that. It's ridiculous. So those are issues that partnerships with, with volunteers is important, but the library one is one. Do you think we can get some status update in a month or so? Yes. Great. Thank you. And then uh, also on the libraries, uh, we're going to need uh, some good figures from both the CAO and the CLA on the charter motion that we put forward. What it, What is the, the dollar value between 00175 and 325 or whatever those numbers are? Yeah, but we we had a little discussion, internal discussion uh, today on that, and we'll be circling back around. And, and I don't know what day it goes to to uh, rules, but uh, we certainly need that so everybody's aware of what those 27. Okay, we go on the rules committee the 27. Okay, the mayor's office has uh, several uh, requested transactions. They'd like to transfer a million from their salaries general account to the salaries as needed account to address their deficit. They'd like to transfer 167,000 donated by community partners to support uh, salary costs with their Million Trees initiative. Uh, there's a request to reimburse the general fund by uh, 154,000 for uh, fiscal year seven justice assistant grants, and to reimburse an additional 104,000 for 08 JAG fund. Uh, there's a request to transfer 402,000 from ARA funds to the offices of the mayor and the city attorney. Uh, the city attorney is for the community law enforcement and rec uh, recovery program and the mayor's office for administrative and grant administration of the grant program. The Ma neighborhood empowerment program is projecting a deficit of 235,000 if the department fills positions to operate as a standalone department. Also, we're reporting that there's a 1.2 million cash shortfall in the neighborhood empowerment trust fund due to inadvertent mission from the special fund schedule. Um, we don't know if actions required or how much is required at this time. 
if it will be dependent on expenditures and then there's a record a request to transfer eighty thousand from the neighborhood council funding program to fund two new neighborhood councils that were certified in ten fiscal year ten the personnel department let me just ask one thing we were told when this whole issue of revamping um, the neighborhood councils that they were going to stay within the budget that was given to them uh, for the next for the rest of this fiscal year and if we're over 235 or projected something has gone haywire because that was one of the commitments that was given to me for me to vote and say go study it uh, and so something's gone haywire um, Claudia Aguilar a big chunk of that is um, their era payouts if the department has to absorb those costs that's right. going to be yeah, they told us that they'd stay within what was allocated right and at that point they were I think anticipating receiving the e rip payout from the UB and they weren't anticipating that hundred thousand dollars from the EAA at this point only one of the positions has been filled um, I think that was one of the things also that we assume was that they were not going to be able to fill those positions start October 1 so the further along we get it cuts you know, into that deficit. So we're working with them very closely to ensure that they'll stay within their funds. Yeah, well, we need to make sure that because that was the commitment. And then, before, well before the end of the, I guess, fiscal year, they're going to come back with a plan. Right. And then, in addition, um, part of the, their their money is separated between the well, it's all in one pot: the funding program and their administrative. The rate at which they spend money out of their neighborhood counseling program, they. There's enough mon money, wriggle room within there to cover us for a short, um, okay. short, shortfall. So it all depends on what money the department is able to get back okay, to cover on, those. On the trust fund, is that money that we're going to take out of the reserve fund to replenish the 1.2? The 1.2 was money that was actually transferred last year to the UB. Um, we inadvertently did not. Um, as so this part is of money that they give the 50,000 per. No, no, this 1.2 is the money that we gave back to the UB last year that wasn't properly accounted for. So when the beginning of the year, we anticipated they had more cash than what they actually had in their accounts. So if, which we're not expecting that to happen this year, if we do need to go make an adjustment, it would have to come back from um, from the UB. UB. So the, but this, neither one of these impacts their 50000 per year allocation? It, it would if um, the, the neighborhood councils were to spend all their money in one year, but as they have various um, fiscal years to uh, spend it, I think last year they spent about a million dollars less than that. So we're not anticipating that they're going to spend all three million this year. So yes, this is a potential. It, it basically to, it goes to it refers to their cash balance in, in the fund, and if their savings they get that's achieved. You know, this year, I mean, they have a shortfall. Um, we'll just have to wait and see as we progress through the year whether or not um, the two will reconcile. If not, we ultimately may have to put in money from the reserve fund, assuming you know all the neighborhood councils spend the money, et cetera, et cetera. All right, thank you. The uh, personnel department is projecting a deficit of 516,000, of which 346 is in salaries general account, and 170,000 is in the as needed account. Uh, this assumes that anticipated reimbursements are received, and that they realize savings with the delayed opening of the Metro Detention Center. Um, there is a recommendation to transfer money to their contractual services account, but we're I believe we had in the report a recommendation to transfer some of the contractual services money to their salary account and also a portion to go to the UB um, savings uh, mitigation account. The department has asked if they can hang on to that money um, because they, there are some requirements uh, within their contractual services where they need those funds. Okay, uh, so attachment 11 is the recommendation to transfer contractual service savings uh, from the department to the UB Service Reduction Mitigation Fund. We'd like to delete the recommendation to transfer uh, money from the de personnel departments to that fund. That is a dollar figure of 154? I'm sorry, 100. Yeah, 154,000. So you delete that? Delete that. Okay. 
the recommendation to transfer 346,000 to the salaries general accounts does still does stand. All right, the plan department is projecting a surplus of uh, 582,000 in their salaries general account and that's from realized savings from furloughs and it does do take into account their sick time and ERIP payouts. Uh, they do have a backlog of cases that have been growing since 9-10 and they report that 800 entitlement cases have passed the legal processing deadline. The police department. Let me just ask, do they have the ability to use that surplus for as needed to get some of that work done? Or do they have to start all over on those uh, 800 cases that are beyond the deadline? You know, I, I have not heard back regarding the uh, legal processing deadline and the implications, so I'd have to get back to you on that. Good afternoon, Council Members. I'm Eva Yuan McDaniel with the Planning Department. Um, we are using some overtime money to process some cases, but we are down to 241 staff members now. And even with overtime and the nine meetings and all, it's very difficult. And um, we're, we're doing everything possible to get the cases done. I do want to clarify something. Currently, uh, the Planning Department's adopted furlough plan actually was for six furlough days because 20, only 25 percent of our budget is general fund. But because planning's work, it cannot be separated out to full-time positions as general fund or special fund. When our former director was here, we took the strategy of spreading the general fund furlough onto all the employees. And we were hoping to be able to get off the furlough program um, much earlier than the end of the fiscal year. We do, the furlough plan was adopted with six days, but we do not have the authority to be off the fur off furlough uh, without the approval from the CEO's office and the mayor's office. But we will be working with them to, um, with the hope to uh, terminate the furlough program sooner than 26 days because if we furlough more than what our furlough goal is, we will be um, going into the special fund, which is not what the intent was. But let me ask you, the special fund, uh, were, they, they were, that was set up so that you can deal with these, what, entitlement cases? I mean, are they, do you have to start from scratch if they've gone past the deadline? I'm sorry, could you? If you've gone past the deadline on 800 entitlement cases, do they have to start all over? Can they be uh, cured? Or? No, we, we, we don't have to start all over. The cases are just waiting to be processed. We can get to them. And as soon as we can get off the furlough program, then we will be able to get more, more staff time capacity to processing the cases. Now, I thought when doing budget, you talked about uh, um, as needed employees to deal with some of this spiked workload. Is that still available? Yes, we are um, contacting retiring employees to see if they will be interested. Not all retiring employees are interested in coming back to work. Mm -hmm. And also certain case backlog cannot be processed by non, uh, for example, the um, zone uh, zoning administration cases, they have to be processed by the zoning administrators. So there are very limited number of um, employee, retiree employees in those in that class. But we are working on that. And we're um, also working on getting managed hiring exemptions. And I heard some good news, but have not been able to confirm. Uh, we're hoping to get some extra capacity in the ne very near future. Okay, let me ask on the, on the, uh, the audit, or not audit, but the accounting procedures, any support there that's going to be able to bring those fees in? Because uh, they said here that we have the accounting function, including billing, collections, and refund claims, is also got a backlog. We have a very serious shortage in our accounting section. Um, just recently, in the past couple of weeks, we have lost, a, we're losing an accountant in the expedite accounting section and also a management analyst too who was handling the billing and data co 
collection for the expedite cases. We have submitted the managed hiring request to fill those vacancies, and I hope there will not be any concerns because these are full cost recovery positions, and we will be working with the CEO's office on getting those items on the agenda for the next managed hiring committee meeting. Did you resolve some of those civil service issues about our hiring people? I don't know whether, I guess it's a CAO issue. It's where they get a uh, managed hiring position and they can do the back bill at the same time? We are looking at those as requests that come forward. We haven't just granted those to everything. Um, the committee did recently approve um, our request for a number of positions. Because yeah. the thing is, I don't believe that 26 furloughs are going to go away, but if we could give some ability to do the the uh, managed hiring and the backfill at the same time, but I think most of their positions are internal. To go through it twice is... Uh, they are, most of them are internal. Uh, here again, we do have, I mean, at the, the bottom rug of the ladder, they do come from the street, most of them, and, and so that's a consideration. Uh, I think um, as we go forward, we need to continue to be discussed with them uh, regarding the overall budget, uh, whether, you know, positions move forward through managed hiring or whether or not there needs to be other considerations given their operational plan, furloughs, et cetera. So I think that if we've raised those fees to full cost recovery and the business community came in and supported them and all of that stuff, that we wouldn't want to end up with a surplus and not doing the work. I, I would agree, and it's uh, unless, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think they're necessarily tracking a whole bunch of surplus money at this point. Um, but we certainly are, that's a consideration in the overall picture. So. Yeah, it's, it's only a half of me, and I'm sorry, I thought it was a lot. <laughs> it's not a half me, it's not a lot. Okay. But let's see, if we could help them. Uh, particularly with that, uh, that would get the accounting issues dealt with, which is billing and collections, and also the 800 entitlement workload. Any way that we can assist them, uh, then uh, I would appreciate it. Okay. Okay. So stay on, stay on Ray. Don't let him slip at all. <laughs> they know me. I will follow up. And, and ask for yeah, the back bills every time. She has the number. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right, the uh, police department <laughs> is our fifth department that we're requesting an operational plan. Uh, currently, there are de deficits estimated at 18.1 million, but they do expect to re receive another 3 million in, re um, in reimbursement, so that would result in a deficit of 15.1 million. Um, they have an 8.3 million of that is attributed to their civilian salary accounts and um, of which all of that is attributed to their ERIP payouts, deferred sick, and um, uh, reduced furloughs. The uh, other deficits are for their sworn salaries, and that's 6.8 million, and they also have 2.5 million in their contractual services account and another 500,000 in their field equipment accounts. Just curious about the 8.3, and when we were doing the ERIP and all that, was that all understood that it might result in that? Uh, we do have money set aside in the UB uh, to pay for those costs that departments could not absorb. So there's about, um, I believe, there's 21.2 million of general fund money set aside in the UB and another 12.4 money, 12.4 million for departments set up. But it wasn't the it wasn't the expectation that departments would absorb the full cost if they couldn't. Okay. And so this is the department that's going to have the plan. Yes, that is correct. Now, any consideration on uh, with 18 plus million dollars shortfall, if, do continue to going forward with the classes after August? That My understanding is that there are no more scheduled classes until November. The 18.1 I'd like to point out is um, that's their current deficit without the reimbursements. If they do receive reimbursements, it does reduce it to 15.1. That. Uh, liabilities all in the overtime account, so they actually may receive additional reimbursement at the close of the fiscal year for some of those overtime costs as well. But for my figures, is that they the figures could be as much as uh, 3.8 on the reimbursement that has no uh, revenue source, and then you're still dealing with all of the uh, 
EAA furloughs and things of that nature. That's correct. So that would, and then you're dealing with their other reimbursement, their other accounts. Could we just have, I know this is always a concern, but at least some discussion or paperwork on looking at, is there a need for the November class if the deficits are still as high as they are today? If we're still looking at double-digit deficits, can we afford a class in November, which is just a month or two away? Okay. We have some recommendations as well. There's a recommendation to reappropriate $25,000 in funding provided by CRA for the purchase of cameras and Wi-Fi equipment. And the request to- Can we just say on the police thing that this is coming before the council on Wednesday? Yes. Is this coming before the council? Yes. That Mr. Parks' last question should be used within that Wednesday's discussion. Okay. And then we additionally have a request to reappropriate $679,000 from money from the Street Revenue Furniture Fund for the purchase and installation of security cameras. That's where Dennis is speaking. Okay. The Public Works Board is projecting a general fund deficit of $100,000, but a surplus of $103,000 for special funds. And they're going to try to identify savings in other areas to offset this deficit, including transferring employees to special funds. The Bureau of Contract Administration is not projecting a year-end deficit at this time, but they are reevaluating their workload estimates, so that may be revised next FSR. The Bureau of Engineering is projected to complete the year within budget. However, they are projecting a $5 million surplus in their sewer capital fund due to vacancies in the wastewater program. They also are reporting that their receipts are 3% less, but it's too early to tell if we need to modify that. Is this another issue with modified, I mean, with the managed hiring, with the $5 million surplus? No. I don't believe we have any pending requests before us in the wastewater program from engineering. Certainly the savings need to be sort of viewed in the overall context as we look at the sewer construction and maintenance fund, given any potential rate increases in the future. Will you allow with the sales office? We do not have any unfreeze requests on the sewer capital program at this time. The Bureau has consciously tried to hold some vacancies. They have a 7% salary savings rate in this fund. They've taken people who were to be laid off from other departments into this fund, and also they need to assess what's going to happen on their general fund side in light of the latest MOU improvements on EAA. What work goes undone with this $5 million surplus? Is that projects not? This fund has traditionally had a surplus in wastewater capital. If they don't fill the positions and they have to meet the settlement agreement, they will use consultants if they need to meet those deadlines. They have that flexibility. Do they have that option? They have that option, yes. Okay. The Bureau of Sanitation is reporting a surplus of $10.3 million across all its special funds. There's some discussion here on the Solid Waste Lifeline Rate Subsidy Program. There is an ordinance pending council consideration. At this time, the department is not reporting an impact at the delay in implementation. We need to do whatever we can to get that ordinance out of Energy Commission. We do have a recommendation included in this report. It's recommendation number 24 to approve the ordinance. We're going to ask the CLA to help us get that out of the committee because that's impacting a revenue source. And then do we know if they've started their – they're supposed to do an evaluation or certification program? I believe they have started that. I think we have represented from sanitation to provide further detail on that. But I believe it's my understanding that that assessment or reassessment has started. And so we're still running $4 or $5 million over the cap. The amount of – Anita Rodriguez, CO's office. The amount of the program is actually $23 million annualized without a rate subsidy in place. It's brought down to roughly $16, $17 million with a partial fee in place and assuming a cap of 58,000 customers. 
both of which are addressed in the ordinance. Did we cap a dollar figure? No. The Clean Up Bureau of Sanitation? No. The cap was a verbal motion, and it was $58,651. $58,651. Okay. So we capped the number. Correct. Okay. And then what, this year we're supposed to go to what, 35 percent, and then next year 70 percent? Correct. That's correct. Okay. But that ordinance, without that ordinance, we can't do that. That's correct. And the Bureau of Sanitation has gone through the recertification process. We've worked with the city attorney's office, with the CAO, as well as the Office of Finance. And we have sent out the notifications to all of the lifeline subscribers that the records are received from Department of Water and Power. And the vast majority of those were received. We had 800 applications returned as undeliverable, which we were investigating. And there are 3,000 that we had problems with the U.S. Postal Service delivering those packages. We've also had follow-up letters and e-mails. As of September 20th, we have received 23 responses out of 59,000 letters that were sent out for the recertification process. There have been 12,000 phone calls. This is, again, as of September 20th. A little under 500 walk-in customers. And I had a breakdown of calls in English and Spanish as well. We've been tracking all this in our database. For those where we have received applications but they have been missing information for the recertification, we have sent out follow-up notification letters. Let them know this is what we're missing to process your application. In some cases, it was a proof of income that was missing. So wherever we've been missing documentation, we're working with the Lifeline subscribers to get that information from them. We will be sending out a second notification to all 59,000, well, aside from those who have already been approved. And basically, we have weekly monitoring within the Bureau of Sanitation. We've been working with Department of Water and Power, as I said, and finance to see there are more applications still coming in, new applications as well. So to the extent that anyone would be at some point decertified because they do not meet the requirements for the eligibility, they could in the future reapply as well if they were to meet those requirements. Now, is your department contemplating any rate increases? The Bureau of Sanitation, we are looking at the financing for our wastewater program. As you know, we have a 10-year capital program for, as we just talked about, capital a few moments ago regarding staffing at Bureau of Engineering. So we have a very long-term view on the capital program. We are looking at the financial needs for the program for the future, and we'll be having something to come forward to the CAO, CLA, the council, and the mayor for consideration. The wastewater capital program, what's the third one? Well, we have the three major programs in the Bureau of Sanitation, our stormwater or watershed protection program, our solid resources program, which is funded by the solid waste resources fee, the trash fee, and then the wastewater or clean water program, which is funded by the sewer service charge. And at this point in time, the solid resources program is fully funded. We don't anticipate coming forward with any need for rate adjustments for the next three years. On the watershed or stormwater program, I think there's been a need for an adjustment or rate relief there for probably some time. And I'm not the best person to speak on it, but I know that there has been discussions with the county regarding the county's measure. But the wastewater program is the one that we're looking at right now. One of the things I'm curious about is some of my constituents have cut back on the number of black and green and blue bins when they realize that they pay automatically for three, a blue, no matter if they share with somebody else or whatever. If it's on their account, they do it. But some have cut back on the usage, but it hasn't reflected on their bill. And one constituent told me anecdotally that for years they had cut back, but it was never deducted from the bill. They've now noticed that people are looking at their bills in this down economy more than ever. And this particular constituent researched the state law, and apparently for one year it's in effect. But after that, you cannot come back for more, even if there's a documented record that you cut back on the number of cans years ago. Is there any truth to that? And have you heard any of this? 
Uh, no, we, we have heard from constituents who have said, uh, you know, the standard um, allocation of, of containers is a, a 60 gallon for trash yeah. and then 90 gallons for the, uh, for the green waste, for the yard trimmings, and 90 gallon for the recyclables, the blue bin. And um, would there be a way to look at a smaller trash container so they could reduce yeah. their fee um, or a frequency of collection and such? And so we have had those discussions. I know we've met with, I believe, staff in your office and a couple of their council office, Councilman Smith's office as well. Um, we are looking at that. We, we have a number of pilot programs right now that are in effect. Um, there is uh, there is one we're working with a, another organization uh, to uh, maximize the recycling of the blue bin, for example, that would then uh, provide a little bit of financial incentive those, for those um, rate payers of ours to, to recycle more. They would actually get um, coupons and, and such. They could redeem for discounts for local stores, grocery stores, I mean, you name it. So um, there, there's that. We've had um, other initiatives. We had the food waste uh, recycling program as well. But um, we're happy to discuss it further with you. Yeah. It's something we are looking at, yes. Okay, but but I, I think it's important that when people call in or they eliminate a can or two, mm -hmm. that it ends up reflected on their bill. Because if this particular constituent is accurate, it's been, it's been, she has been paying for it for years when she told them a long time ago not okay. to. Okay. Please refer the account over to us. We'll have, be happy to look into it. Okay. On anything that deals with rate increases, give us a lot of forewarning. I think the only rate adjustments that we will be looking at be for the clean water program at this point in time, okay. um, again, the sewer service charge, and we are looking at it. Um, we'll bring that information forward to the council. I mean, because we don't want to go through a, a Ward and Power episode. Yeah. So. Correct. We understand completely. All right. We have several uh, transactions recommended. A transfer of 150000 to pay a liability claim for the Watershed Protection Program. A reimbursement of 366000 of prior year inspection expenses from the Integrated Solid Waste Management Fund. Uh, we have 1.6 million from the same fund for alternative technology program, a transfer of 750,000 uh, for current year tip fees, a transfer of 27,000 for two general services for mailing costs related to notifications for the changes for the solid waste fee lifeline program, a transfer of 50,000 from the Environmental Affairs Trust Fund to uh, Bureau of Street Services for the the Clavia bikeway event. We have an appropriation of 6000 from that same fund to building and safety to fund moving costs for the movement of the local enforcement agency staff as a result of the elimination of the EAD. Um, transfer of 15000 of uniform account savings to cover office and admin expenses. And finally, we recommend the approval of the ordinance to reduce the amount of the lifeline subsidy. The uh, Bureau of Street Lighting. It is projected that it will have a special fund surplus of 550000 in their salaries general account. We have two transactions recommended. One is for 605000 uh, from salaries general to their hiring hall account to install and perform routine and emergency maintenance on streetlights and the reappropriation of 62000 in Prop A funds for work on Interstate 405. Bureau of Street Services, we're not projecting a deficit for the department at this time. We have several gas tax transfers, including 150000 for bridge and tunnel maintenance, 150000 for guardrail con construction, 300000 for various drainage projects. And then we have 600000 from the subventions and grants fund from DWP for the North Hollywood Outley retrofit project, 12000 from that fund to DOT for overtime related to the Olympic Boulevard street improvement project and 760000 from the fund to DOT over time for its one-stop special events ordinance support. Recreation and Parks is uh, projecting to complete the year within budget. However, um, there is surplus funds in their salaries general account which may be needed to offset a potential revenue shortfalls of which currently they're projecting $2.1 million. That includes golf operations, Griffith Observatory, pools, recreation centers, and reimbursements from special funds. Transportation, we're projecting a deficit of $4 million. They're our last department that we're requesting an operational plan from. Of that $4 million, uh, it's $1 million in their salaries general account, $1 million of, another $1 million attributed to EAA furlough savings, $2 million from the ERIP payouts, and a smaller amount for deferred sick time payouts. 
they're hoping to address the one million from the uh, employment levels by increasing reimbursements from special funds. They're also reporting a shortfall of approximately um, two million for parking citation revenue due to delays in implementing the parking increase in parking citation rates. Do we know what the delay was caused? I'm sorry, what? Do we know why there was a delay in implementing the I don't know what the source of delay is, but it is implemented now. I believe it's supposed to, it was slated for uh, start of the year, and I guess it was implemented in August. The, um, we're recommending a transfer of 108000 in contractual services account uh, to GSD to, uh, for security services at DOT's parking citation ad adjudication centers. We're recommending a transfer of 600000 from the Special Parking Revenue Fund uh, to the contractual services account uh, for the Hollywood and Highland Parking Garage. We're recommending transfer of 635000 in transportation and regulation and enforcement fund money to fund overtime costs at LAPD for the Bandit Taxi Cab Enforcement Program, and another 235000 to the DOT's overtime account, also related to the enforcement program. Uh, we recommend transferring 50000 in Prop C anti-gridlock fund money uh, for overtime costs associated with traffic control, and 5000 in subvention and grants fund money to the general fund for related cost reimbursement for the Santa Monica Transit Parkway project. For the treasurer, we're projecting a small deficit of 7000 and we're hoping that can be eliminated by staggering hiring throughout the year. Uh, the department itself has requested an appropriation of $161,000 uh, from their, to their bank service fee account, but we're not recommending that at this time. They do have $6 million budgeted, and we're hoping that some of that could be absorbed. At this time, however, we are recommending transfer of 2000 in contractual service savings to their seller's general account to offset their deficit. What was the outcome of our request that they and finance get together about banking fees? They did provide a report uh, last, I believe, before either right after the year end or right before the year end. I don't have that report on me, but there was uh, the discrepancy was resolved. Water and power, uh, there's a recommendation to reimburse the department with FEMA funds for fuel that they supplied for the Sayer wildfire. The zoo uh, is expected to complete the year within budget, and they do have a surplus in the nine, of 980000 in their salaries general account, which uh, we'd like to keep right now to, to offset any potential revenue shortfalls, although none are projected at this time. Okay, would you please uh, tell the zoo to come back to us with the plan of charging uh, uh, for parking at their lots. Okay. I've been asking that for a year and a half now. See where they're at. That completes the department discussion. Now we can uh, start with the non-departmental funds. Mm -hmm. uh, the Human Resources Benefit Fund is projecting a deficit of 11.2 million. However, there is about 13.4 million set aside in the UB. So these are the um, the difference between the two is the um, savings that we've identified to address part of the deficit reduction. That's the $2.2 million uh, mentioned in our summary section. The liability of claims account is okay. We're not projecting any Can shortfall. Can just ask one thing? Sure. We just don't want to lose the string on that uh, human resources benefit dealing with medical. Yes. That We uh, ask that the CAO and CLA work with uh, LADWP on their medical plans that are coming up for renewal because uh, they uh, are running about 157 percent increase over the last 10 years, uh, and they we wanted to ensure that they, when they went out for RFP, that uh, they they made it a more open process than what they currently are doing. So we don't want to lose track, even though they're not part of th that human resources account. Uh, for the reserve fund, as we discussed earlier, there's about 174,000 in the fund balance. 120 is in the emergency reserve, and 53 is in the contingency reserve. And finally, we have the unappropriated balance recommendation. That's the um, additional 10% contractual services reductions that were identified for departments to the uh, service reduction mitigation account. And we've just reduced that amount of 305 by the 150 for uh, personnel department. So I will get revised uh, attachment for that recommendation. On, on the reserve fund being that we're going to go to the charter to add the three elements, could we start reporting on that in our reporting? Okay. The uh, stabilization fund is part of the reserve fund. Okay. 
Okay. Um, that's it for department recommendations. We have about nine more sections to go over. Did you want to go over all those, or did you want to speak on to certain ones? Chart. We don't need to go to the charts. Okay. okay. We, uh, if you want to why don't you highlight what may okay. be significant? Uh, the revenues discussed in the next section, which is Section 3, and there are several charts that are also provided. I should say the attachments. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, attachments. So if you begin with the attachment, I'm just going to go from the attachments here. Okay, our first one is the attachment 1A. Um, it gives a summary of um, revenue that's been received through September. So that's planned to date. And uh, what we would like to show is that, you know, for the total, we're about 1% above plan. But if it's too early in the fiscal year to make any adjustments or draw a, a conclusion just based on this limited funding. Um, attachment 1B is economic forecast. Um, if you look at current projections in taxable sales for, two for 2010, uh, they're anywhere from 1.4 to 4.6%. And we're also showing the unemployment rates. It remains in double digits for three years from all the um, forecasts. Attachment 1C is U.S. retail sales. Uh, we'd like you to see that there has been some growth. However, since March through, uh, through September, receipts have been, retail sales have been flat. Oh, you want to take over? <laughs> Attachment 1D is our um, gross domestic product. Um, product, and we'd like to see that you to see that there's a lower revised forecast. So you can see the um, history, the April 2010 forecast um, has, is higher than the September 2010 forecast. The attachment 1E is uh, the city's 1% sales tax and local unemployment rate. And there you like, we'd like you to see that sales tax increases when unemployment drops. So uh, with un double digit unemployment, we're not projecting sales tax to grow. Uh, significantly. Attachment 1F is the uh, revenue monthly status report for property taxes and there, you know, as Ray reported, we are seeing significant growth. But now in that one, you said on one of your reports that one of the growth issues, we had money that was really last year's money that we got this year. That's right. That's a, that's a secured. So, so un until, I guess, December or so, we won't really know uh, where we are for this this, this year. Yeah. Rex Olive, CAO. We're going to know first installment property tax December, January. Okay. And so what we have is a one time, one time. good $10 million, but it's not like it's an indicator of where we're going this year. Right. Okay. And that's, that's attachment 1G, which is the uh, secured yeah. property tax receipts. Uh, 1H is the 12 month moving sun of secured property tax. And we are showing that early receipts. Um, uh, made up for previous declines, and uh, we also see potential for decline. Attachment one, what is this? I. <laughs> we um, see that the state payment is down. Uh, go ahead. Attachment one I is um, another small windfall. This is the triple flip money, and we had a lower payment last year, and we get a make up this year. Okay, so I switched that with 1J where it's uh, yeah. down. Okay. Okay. Uh, 1K is the documentary transfer tax, and there we had um, budgeted 17%, uh, but we're above um, previous year's receipts, but we're actually receiving only 14% above. Um, attachment 1L is the documentary transfer tax, and that's sort of the, that's the same. Uh, it's just the same information in a different format. Attachment 1M is deeds recorded in the city. And we were seeing increases except for a decline in August. Okay. Attachment 1N is sales tax. And uh, there we're seeing the 1.8 million uh, decline, drop in budget. 1O is the change in city sales tax uh, allocation by quarter, and there we're seeing a growth in taxable sales, about 4%. Yeah. So the significance there is the state paid us less than this last quarter than our actual taxable sales. And we hope to get that back in December if, that, if the underlying sales continue. 
one p is a comparison of city county and state sales tax and there you see city growth is uh, less than count county and state one q is state and city sales tax and this is tracking the um, it shows the growth of the city sales tax rec uh, receipts in comparison with the state one r is our utilities user tax which as we've reported is down uh, 1s is a, that component of the electric electric users tax and that is down 1t is the gas users tax which is also another component and that is up and uh, when you is the cost of natural gas, we do see a recent drop in natural gas prices. One V is the telephone users tax, and there it's down, and we're citing the economy as well as uh, price competition. One W is the parking users tax, and that is up. One S, X, I'm sorry is also uh, the parking users tax at the moving sum and it shows that's following the economy one y is the transit occupancy tax which we also reported as increasing and finally the last one's one z which is the city hotel tax receipts also showing increases that's it for the revenue okay. attachments did you want to go on with other have we tired you out <laughs> <laughs> I'm always tired but <laughs> how would you need any more information on the chart no. okay why don't we just uh, approve the CAO recommendations with the uh, stated uh, recommendations and amendments uh, and report back so moved.